This week's episode is sponsored by Ryan at Change. If you are looking to get involved in e-commerce and build a successful online business, then check out my good friend Ryan, who I have been working with the last few years and attended many events and retreats all around the world, spending time with members who are making some serious money. I have been promoting Ryan for a while now because I believe in what he does and not only has he helped and supported me build my own businesses, but I have seen firsthand how he helps and supports his members take their businesses to new levels and give them financial freedom. So if you are interested in getting into e-commerce and building successful online stores, then message Ryan on his Instagram at RyanJB to join his winning team. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. Okay. And today's guest, we've got Robert Soul, R Soul, but R dot Soul. I clicked on straight away. <laughs> um, undercover copper, yes, undercover that's right, gangster. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you were shipping drugs, guns. Quite dark story. You were undercover for nearly twenty years. Yeah, um, you kind of went mad yourself mentally. Yeah, yeah. which is understandable because I've interviewed a few undercover coppers now in their heads because they're playing different characters. I don't know what damage that does, but we'll touch in all that through the interview but first and foremost how are you i'm very very well and it's good to be here yeah, and, it's uh, good you know, to have you on. you've got a good reputation out there um a few of my mates said get hold of james english he's the, he's the right guy for you and i did so yeah. that's why we're here and i'm pleased to be here the book will plug straight away barking mad the true story of a former serious organized crime agency detective who went undercover for 17 years but survived and came out of the other side dancing barking mad it's called where can people buy your book it's Robert? on amazon um i don't make much money ever to be fair I wrote it as a legacy document for my kids and people who didn't know because all my, I lied to all my friends for 17 years about where I was and who I was. I made up stories about what I did that day and uh, I never spoke about it. And I've always been shy of talking about it. And I'm not a, I'm not a big-headed guy. I mean, I've always played down who I, who I really am. But I thought I've got the chance to see you and, and open the book a bit and open the story. And, and then everyone who knows me, because people will see this, will go, wow, I, that's amazing. I know they're going to say that before the, we even to get started because yeah. it's going to be a shock. Before we get into all the nitty gritty though, I always like to go back to the start with my guests. Yeah. Get a bit of understanding about you, yeah. where you grew up and how it all began. Yeah. So basically, I don't have much recollection before five years old. Why is that? I don't know. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't know because my memory won't go back any further. I don't know whether I cut it off. But any to cut, not, other, not under five that I remember, no. And what, what basically happened was my mum and dad, he was Catholic, she was Protestant. And his family were really strict Catholic. And as far as I'm aware, it's never been discussed. I think they eloped and got married. And um, he was a fit return at the docks in Middlesbrough, in a, in a rough part of Middlesbrough, in the northeast. And he got a job at Sizewell Power Station in Leyston in Suffolk. And we all moved down there to Leyston. And it was idyllic. It was a brand new house. It was a short walk um, to the beach. And Dad worked at this nuclear power plant. But they, they had a lot of kids. We, by that time, we, we, I was five and we had four kids. <laughs> which to me is ludicrous. When, you're, when you haven't got a lot of money, having a lot of kids is just going to kill you. And us. So we had four kids. I went to school there when I was five years old. One of my two stories I really remember from, from my chose was one day this lad called Porky Jones was a school bully. He used to beat me at school, but this time he ran home after me all the way to beat me at some point. And I got to the house, ran the door, I was crying my eyes. I said, Dad, Porky Jones is trying to kill me. He said, come on, son, we'll sort him out. So we marched back out of the house, got to where Porky Jones was, and Dad goes, right, sort him out, son. Walked back and locked the door. <laughs> and we had a massive fight on our garden lawn. And he beat me, but the bullying stopped immediately, and he wanted to be my friend. And I realised there and then that bullies don't want to be hit back. They want free hits. 
you know, that's they're pushing themselves on a free hit. They're, the last thing they want is a battle. And I gave them a battle. And, and, it, and it changed my life completely. As far as that, the fighting side of life is concerned, from that forward, I thought, I'm going to learn to fight, no matter what. And then my mum, I went to the local news agency, Mr. Kemp's, and I nicked six bars of Caramac. And I took them home, and I'd give one to my sister. And uh, Elizabeth, she grasped me up to my mum. My mum fucking picked me up by the ear, and she slapped me up round the face every step of the way back to Mr. Kemp's. She made me get down on my knees and apologise for thieving and give back the four caramel bars I'd left. And I thought, after that, I'm never nicking another thing. I'm never, I'm never going to be dishonest. I'm not a dishonest person anyway, but I just, that's really sealed the deal for me. And then mum and dad decided to go for another child, fifth child, like in six years. And uh, Tina was born, but she died after three months of a, what we'd probably say would be a cop death now. And it blew the family apart, blew my mum and dad apart. They became argumentative, fighting, and eventually it, the relationship deteriorated to such a degree that we said we're going back to Middlesbrough to be near mum's parents in um, Middlesbrough. So we moved back and we moved it to Grangetown, which is literally one of the main shitholes of the northeast. It is not the jewel of the north, it's an absolute kazi. And they're knocking down houses to build slums there. And we moved in, five kids, four kids, so one had died, um, and they started having more kids. They had another three until we have seven under 10 years old. No money. Dad, like, earning peanut money at the docks. And uh, the local people who were in there, we had a southern accent. We weren't Northerners anymore. We got beaten senseless by everybody. They put me to the local school. We were so poor, I was the only kid in senior school in shorts. I got my head kicked in for that. And the other thing at the senior school, Sir William Words, it was called. They had... Um, what they call it. They had toilets with um, bars ab ab above the doors. And you had to run, the, was running the gauntlet was called, and you had to run from one end and all the others would swing through and kick you in the face as you went through. I must have gone through there 30 times in the first year at that school, getting kicked senseless by the other kids because of things that were wrong with me. That was no fault of my own, it was just poverty. Um, and then my dad uh, got a job in Saudi Arabia working for Amco Oil and his money went through the roof. And you think, oh, you know, this is going to be amazing now. And I did. We all thought that, you know, he's, it's going to be great. And it was for a couple of months. But my dad was a bullshitter. And he, working with the guys in Bahrain, he told me he had no kids. He didn't want to meet at seven. You know what I mean? Why would he? And one of my younger sisters, um, she became Berlin. She became physically and mentally handicapped. Now, there's two stories. One I've, one I've been known from birth, which that was that one of us swung her out of a pram and she hit the brick wall and she became mentally unwell and disabled. But recently, in the last couple of years, my mum's sister has confided that mum took her, tried to abort her with a pill and that caused the brain damage. So I don't know which of those stories is true, but either way, she's now 59, but she's still alive, um, with the mental capacity of a three-year-old and spent all of, virtually all of her entire life in a wheelchair. Um, and I don't know where the truth is. That's a sad story, but I thought, why did... Because they had Lynn as number, number five. Tina was number five, but she died. Then Lynn was number six. And then... And she was handicapped. And then we had seven and eight, effectively. And I, thought, what? I said to my mum and dad when, we, when I was older, what did you do that for? Why did you sentence us all to absolute poverty just to keep having children when there was no need? Three, four, if you can, you can afford four, four. I've only got, I only had two. Me and my wife, when I got married in later, we said we can only afford two. We're having two then. And I've never understood why you'd have more unless you've got the money to give them a life, give them a good life. You know, you bring kids into the world, you can never give a good life to them. I, I didn't understand it. And I never have. So he went to, he went to, uh, Saudi, to Bahrain, working for Ramco Oil. And then um, he stopped coming home because the guys who were out there didn't come home. They went to Malta and on their, they had a six week on, six week off shift. And they, eat, and they went to Malta and they just shagged prostitutes and got pissed. And he started doing the same. He stopped sending many, money home. So now we had seven kids, single parent, a mum going out to try and work to, to earn money at a bar. She started drinking, became a chronic alcoholic. And, uh, and my dad was a heavy drinker as well, all through our lives. And he did come back, flitting in and out back as well um, over time but not, not, not consistently enough to be, be of any influence on any of us. And I, me and my sister, Elizabeth, became the parent, parents to the younger five. Because my mum and dad were incapable, they were pissed as far as all the time. And my mum would, um, 
drink like eight to 12 barley wines a day. Um, and like three would knock most adults out. And she used to pick fights with me. She's a really spiteful woman. Um, and my dad was really docile. So they, uh, they used, you know, they'd go both, when they, when they were together, they'd get pissed together. He'd fall asleep. She'd punch him in the face. <laughs> that kind of thing, you know, or punch us. So um, we had an absolutely awful childhood um, all, all the way through, uh, all the time. For the, for the 16 years I was, I was a child, it was absolutely awful. No money, no clothes, cross-dressing with each other's clothes on all the time. Um, no food. We used to eat, our pr principal diet was jam and bread or pork dripping or beef dripping on bread. We had one hot meal a week if we were lucky. We had no telly, no record player, no luxuries, no covers on our beds. We used to be, put coats on to go to bed at night. My dad would take his coat off when he went to work in the morning and leave you freezing on the bed. But there was no sheets, no blankets. It was absolutely awful beyond extreme. How does that dysfunctional family then play a massive part in your adult life from being bullied, from the disabled sister, the broken home, the alcoholic parents? How does that shape you as a person when you get older? Do you think it does a lot of damage or do you think it, it makes you appreciate life? It makes you appreciate life. <clears throat> I mean, and, I, and I'm going to qualify that by saying, I would say all of us, all the ones who were, like, apart from Lynn who was me mentally handicapped and couldn't walk if she wanted to, um, we've all become industrious, hardworking, honest people all our lives you know my, my brother my youngest brother who's literally who had the the, the um the two younger ones gail and james had the worst of it all they had like you know because i joined the navy at 16 and left them they had the worst of it all and they still turned out really good people and and he's a multi-millionaire now you know self-made millionaire mm -hmm. but you'd never think if you spoke to him you wouldn't know he had a penny in his pocket yeah he's not flash he's a real gent and everybody who i know him loves him yeah, it's like it's like anything in life, no matter good or bad, your life can go both ways. The Absolutely. exact same, good or bad. I think there's a story of the alcoholic father, and they had twins. One became the alcoholic, just like his father. Another became a successful businessman, businessman who just didn't want to even touch drink, see drink, be around people who are drunk. Um, but it's sad being in that sort of environment because when you understand the parents as well and how their past is and how they become alcoholics and the shit that they go through, it's, mm. it's hard. I don't blame my mum at yeah. all. I think if, you know, any, any woman left alone with seven kids, one of them in, in a wheelchair, but she had to wear this massive white sponge padded helmet all the time because she, she threw fits and headbutted the wall uh, if she, or anything she was near, so she had to wear that. And again, look going back to the cruelty of the North, I, I like Northern people. They are the salt of the earth people of the North, I think. Uh, they're, they're much more friendly um, than the South. They're, they're just really, really good, good people. And they try the best for their families in difficult circumstances. But for, as an example of cruelty, my mum used to make me take Lynn out in the wheelchair for a walk to get some fresh air. So I'm walking in the, with the wheelchair this up the road. And then I see these two guys coming from the school. I mean, I'm in the senior school. And one of them was, let's get that twat with a spacker. That twat with a spacker. So they start chasing me. I've got the wheelchair pushing her and they're running after me. So I'm running like a fucking idiot, like up the road, like a loony, absolutely petrified, crying, crying my eyes out. And the catchers, they beat the shit at me, tipped her out the wheelchair on top of me and run off. And I thought, how could you do that? What kind of mentality would make somebody do that? And that's when I think people are made wired differently, aren't they? Everybody's wired differently. I would never do that. I would never hurt a disabled person. I wouldn't hurt a, a, a normal person who wasn't hurting me. But to actually throw a disabled kid out of a wheelchair on top of the brother you've just beaten up, I just don't get it. Yeah, that's some sick shit, that. Yeah. And that's some next level. That's some deranged kids, that. Yeah. To even think that. But what have they been through to even be acting like that as well? Exactly. It's, um, so even you joined the Navy at 16, was that an easy decision just to get away? Or was it hard because you knew you were letting your younger siblings down? It was, it, it, well, it wasn't hard to join because I didn't intend to. What happened was um, I was mixing with some of the criminals on the estate. Not, not doing anything wrong, not stealing, but I used to be, um, we had motorbikes, used to ride motorbikes around, big, you know, motorbikes, no crash helmets, no insurance, no license, all around the estate. And um, my mum thought he's going to end up going to jail if I don't sort him out. So she, um, she applied in my name for me to join the Navy. And I got a letter through from the Royal Navy and said, oh, <laughs> please come to Hartlepool 
for a maths and English test to join the Navy. And I was like, what? My mum goes, well, you may as well go. You've got nothing else going for you. you know, you're going to end up in trouble otherwise. So I went, did the maths and English test and had the interview and passed and ended up joined up in 1976. And it was a pull to get me away because I knew that my younger siblings were going to have an awful life, you know, literally. And to give an example again, my mum was cruelly. My younger sister, Gail, when she was going through puberty, so she would have been about 11, 12, um, she stole something and mum found out. And mum stripped her off bollock naked, sat on the dining room table, put a sign around her head saying, don't feed or talk to me, I'm a thief. And left her there for eight hours. And I thought, how can you do that to your kids? How can you be that cruel? to your children, you know. Uh, discipline's completely frowned on, though, is it? Which I'm not with. I'm, I'm with discipline. I think children need to know the rights and wrongs of the world. Mm -hmm. But that's just like a bridge way, way too far down the line. You know, that's not a beat. And my dad used to beat us all the time with a bat. You know, what they called a smack bat. With a, it was designed to smack you. Mm -hmm. He used to beat us with that. But my mum was immensely cruel and she was pissed. Unbelievably spiteful. Yeah, but then like, that makes you question what did happen to your sister back then as well. Yeah. Um, because if she's got seven kids... She clearly doesn't. She's not going to take anything for abortion because she's obviously went with seven. So whether she's been drunk, and this is me just looking from what you're saying, it as a possibility that you're drunk and someone's crying and you're thinking, fuck this, and you know, and things get laid out of hand. Like, mm -hmm. that's, what was your mum's upbringing? My mum had a good upbringing. My mum and dad's parents were strict, but good. Dads were absolute arseholes, Catholics. And I'm not saying Catholics are arseholes. Yeah, I'm saying they were, they excommunicated. I never met them. I never met his, his family, any of them, mm -hmm. ever in my life. You know, they excommunicated him when he married mum. Whereas her, with his mum's um, mum and dad, um, dad, which is again, which is what we talked about when, before we started about the seismic shift in power of women and men nowadays. When I used to, I to stay with my grandma, just to get food now and then, because we never got fed at home. And I remember my granddad, Jim, coming in. He'd walk in from work. He worked at Aisha, the petrochemical factory. He'd walk in. He'd sit down on his chair in front of the fire, which was lit by my, my grandma. She'd come out of the kitchen, undo his shoelaces, take his shoes off, put them to one side, put his slippers on his feet, light his pipe, put it in his mouth and say, I'll be back in a minute with your dinner, Jim. <laughs> well, can you imagine anybody doing that now? You know, to that, that level of obedience to the man. And, and uh, but yeah, they were strict, but they were nice. Yeah, yeah. James have. And they had, they had, they had good. She had, their mum had good sisters and brothers, and they supported us as well. They knew we were having an awful time. And although they didn't live anywhere near us, they used to drive and pick us up and take us out for days out and that kind of thing. Yeah. But it was childhood. I have no fun memories of childhood at all. None at all. So what was it like then, from being bullied, like I say, the dysfunctional kind of family, mm -hmm. for life full of chaos, to then going to the navy? Like, was it a total Culture shift shot. for you when you're thinking? <laughs> Yeah. Was, was it more peaceful though? Or um, was that another form of bullying? What was it like it, when you it, went there? It, it is, it, the, the services are a form of bullying. And I actually feel that it's, I'd rather call it discipline when it's like that. When they're trying to get you to be something, hmm. to be clean, to wash your own clothes, to iron, to cook, to be self-sufficient, to polish your boots. It's, it's, I think it was a, for me, it was like, well, I like this. I like the fact they want me to be fit. They want me to be tidy. Because I, I always wanted to be tired. In my school report when I left Sir William Wurzes, when I, when I passed the exam at the grammar school, it said, Rob is a very bright individual, but he needs to take more care of his personal appearance. I thought, what kind of fucking teacher? thought I wore the clothes I wore by choice. You know, it just doesn't happen, does it? And... Uh, I, I enjoyed discipline. I loved it. I took to like a duck to water. Did it, uh, is that because of the shit you went through as a kid, the kickings, the beatings, and that became yeah, yeah, not was, normal, but it was easier because it, you knew it was helping you in a way? Yeah. But I, and, and also, with that kind of upbringing we had, I, I would say I can't be hurt. I can't be hurt emotionally. I can't be hurt physically because I've been massively emotionally and physically hurt a lot. I'm not saying I wouldn't cry if something was, was sad, but I'm not frightened of anybody. I'm not frightened of anybody in the world. If you want to, if you want, if you're prepared to kill me, that's fine. I'm not. I'm not worried about it. I'm not worried about dying. I've got no. I've got respect for my own life, but I don't think about my. I don't protect my life. Do you know what I mean? I couldn't have done what I did for 17 years if I was worried about my life, because I could have died many, many times over that period. Mm -hmm. What did you do in the navy then? I joined the navy in '76, and I originally went into Palau submarines up at Faz Lane. Yeah, it's up near Loch Lomond. It is, yeah, 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 yeah. Epifazlane. Uh, but I hated it. 
Why? Well, because the the, the nuclear submarines, the, the, the Polaris submarines, which are basically nuclear deterrent submarines, they leave Faslane, they sink, they disappear for three months, and when they come back up, they're at Faslane. And I joined the Navy to travel, but I went in there for money because it was £13 a fortnight more if you went to submarines. So I was on £11 a week. I thought £13 a fortnight was a lot of money. I'll go for that. But when I got there, I didn't like it. So I came back, retrained, and then went to uh, normal ships as a radar operator. What's that? Like, um, you know the things that spin on the top of the yeah, ships? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That control all the... You, can you tell you everything that's around you? Aircraft, mm -hmm. ships, everything. Um, and in operations, when I worked in there... And I did, I did um, nine years doing that in the Navy, for the Royal Navy, as a radar operator. And I got promoted a couple of times. Um, some, there's some good stories at that. Is, um, we went, on my first trip, we, I joined HMS Exeter, um, up on the Tyne being built. And we joined, I joined it in 79. And the dockyard worker used to come to the ship. Fishing rod, sleeping bag, no work. I was there for a year. They didn't do a stroke. And then they, obviously the government had put the pressure on to get the ship out. So they pulled, the sh pulled all the stops out, did thousands of pounds of overtime and then got the ship ready. But they were then screaming about why have the time shipyards been demised? Why have they been shut down? The next contract from the Navy went to Hamburg after Exeter because you can't have people coming on board for a year at a time and doing nothing, doing no work. And it was union controlled. So you, you, nobody got sacked. Nobody did nothing. Um, and then after, that, af after the Exeter, we went... To, First, so we went to a Portugal, um, a place called a Porto, and um, the uh, the docks are always in the rough part of town. Any any docks tend to be in the rougher part of the sea, and we had to cross the bridge to get to the main town for nights out. And every night, our lads were getting robbed at night at knife point by thugs, Portuguese thugs. And then me and another couple of lads, we said, right, enough's enough. We're going to stop this tonight. So we called together forty guys, watched the cult movie the warriors you seen that one yeah, yeah, yeah. watch the warriors and then we set off me and this other lad called alan we we were walked up uh, Ian, sorry, walked up across the, the bridge where the robbers were all taking place pretending to be pissed we had 40 guys armed to the gills hockey sticks baseball bats everything six people come along with a woman attacked us with knives we, we shouted to the boys they came out we absolutely chased them into the town and battered them to fucking death beat them all to sense, smashed the cafe in and smashed the 10 guys in who were in the cafe. And then the um, a, a big gang came, about 100 strong. We, and now a lot started running now because it's starting to get a bit frightening. It was literally, um, it was a proper full-on riot. But they, they ran away. And there was about 20 of us left and there was 100 of them. And my mate goes, charge! <laughs> we all went running towards them <laughs> like idiots. And they ran away. 100 people plus ran away. And then we, we heard gunshots and the police come. They started firing us, firing guns at us. So we ran back to the ship and they stormed the police. The, uh, the, the whole town stormed, uh, the whole town, sorry, stormed the, uh, stormed the ship. And we had to put uh, fire hoses on them at 200 PSI and keep them at bay. So that was that. Uh, See, when you're doing the radar thing, were you ever under attack? How far can it spot? Oh, the miles, the, 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 the air ones, mile, 240 miles. So that's how far it goes out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably long further now, yeah. So if you were under attack, but how long does it take for a... Say you were under attack, a plane could get 240 miles in what? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, without a doubt. 10 but, minutes, 20 yeah. minutes? But, well, the, my only experience, and I wasn't in... I didn't go to this, um, the Fortnite's War, but it was 82 and I was in at the time. But like I said, it, it was an absolutely frightening experience there for, the, for all the boys on the ships. You know, if they'd have had a bit more bulb they'd have done a lot more damage but they didn't want to get they couldn't come up high because the radar would get them and they couldn't come down too low because the, the terrain so a lot more people would have died and i don't fancy ships chances much in a war if i'm with you yeah. war. you're stuck you? how, yeah. how oh. fast do submarines and ships go 30 knots yeah that's nothing nothing no no you can't you can't run away for sure <laughs> how fast do those air some of those air those fighter jets go as well oh. about seven eight hundred miles an hour two thousand miles now yeah, yeah no. 1500 miles yeah yeah that's yeah. crazy isn't it you're not gonna do it. and they, also the missiles you know the, the how fun. fast does a missile go i'm, I'm not sure because i might been out there but what they do is that the missiles are launched from wherever they're launched and then some of them they drop like super attendant they drop to the floor the missiles extra set and then they run along the ground you know, like a foot off the waves. You can't see them with a radar screen. Because what, some of the ships and aeroplanes now fly, they're not even registered in the radar, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, they made them, designed them to be not, 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 not picked up by radar, yeah, yeah. 
So, fuck that, mate. We're uh, glad you're well, out uh, <laughs> well, well, I did think, because what I was in, in 82, um, have you ever heard of field gun? No. Right, there's a, there's a, there used to be a thing called the Royal Navy Field Gun Competition, which was, um, it was at Earl's Court in front of the uh, Royal Family, and it's basically running a gun in a limber box in, in, with teams and racing around a, around a circuit, a man-made circuit. And in 82, I was running field gun for Portsmouth. Um, and that's another real test of like mental strength and physical strength and uh, fitness. And I ran for there. So when the fort was cracked off, they kept the field gun going and I didn't go to war at all. Uh, um, and I stayed with field gun. So how did the corpus come about? What, what was the plans? Basically what happened was when I was the helicopter controller for HMS Exeter, the pilot who I'd saved his life a couple of times when things had gone a bit hairy because of my radar skills. And what happened? Um, well, it, it was gone. It was suddenly went like covered in a complete fog. He couldn't see the ship. So I had to bring him back using the radar screen. And bear in mind, it's a tiny, tiny blip the size of a, you know, cocoa pop on the screen. And I'm bringing him back to the ship 10 miles away. I got him back on board with the procedures that were, were, were trained. So how do you navigate that then? So how does that, how does... What's the navigation skills then for you to guide that onto the ship if he can't see? What does he go by? He goes by what you're telling him. Everything you tell him to do, he does. Like to the end. Direction. Yeah, so he'll go, I'll go drop 200, come left, come right, you know, all the way until eventually he gets to the point where he's about a foot from the ship and he can see it. And then he lands. And so I've saved him a couple of times of that. How dangerous is our helicopters? Because you always see them crash. Like Never should be flying. They're, they're agricultural fly machines. That's how they've been described by the military. Um, and, but he said to me, the pilot, he said, look, um, <clears throat> he said, because you've been so good and done some things that have, have helped me out a lot, he said, I'm going to take him and let you have a flyer, the Lynx helicopter in the, in, the, in, the, in the training seat. So I said, all right. And so I goes into the training seat the part of the Lynx helicopter. Let me fly for 15 minutes. He says, Rob, he says, you are a natural pilot. He said, you've got all the function skills to, to, to fly. He said, I'm going to recommend you for pilot training. And he did. Um, and it would have been at the time when the um, jump jet Harriers were coming out. He said, if you pass the flying course, he said, you will be a jump jet Harrier pilot. I would not have been made for life then. But being a wanker at school, barking about, fighting, not paying attention, making everybody laugh, because I was a class comedian everywhere I've been, um, I didn't take any exams. I didn't pass any exams. So he sent the report off the Admiralty to get me to fly... Um, helicopters and jump jets and um about three months later came back um sorry can't come into dartmouth naval training college without five o levels five gcse's sorry not good enough and i thought then i was capable of getting the gcse but i didn't care about them and i've, I've i kicked myself for years after that i've got to say because i could have been flying planes now you know what i mean Instead of going over undercover with gangsters. Would you have had as well, much fun though? I'll tell you what, the flying plays have been less dangerous. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I, um, I was, oh, so anyway, so he says, you know, unprecedented, you can't come to Dartmouth with no others. So the pilot goes, I'm not having that. They dug his heels in and he sent me to HMS Nelson where they had an education centre and I started doing O level courses a week and a month to O level. And I passed the first one in a, in a week, English. So I thought, right, I'll do the next one. I had to do physics, maths, and two others, but I couldn't get physics. And while I was there doing the education centre stuff, um, the police turned up and did a recruitment drive. And I went to the, to the seminar, and I went, well, that sounds like a bit of fun. And that's how, that's how I'm leaving to join the police, because I couldn't get the physics. And I, I gave it two goes, and they thought, no, nah, I can't do it. I got to, I'm going to join the police. And I applied to join the police. What age did you join them? 25. Do you regret that decision? Not at all. Oh, do I regret not? I, 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 my biggest regret is not passing the others at school. If I could say anything to anybody going forward, get in there and get them exam results because that, sometimes that's all that counts, you know, particularly in skill, with skills like that, with, with flying and jobs that involve that kind of stuff. They want the other levels. They want the, the qualifications up front. And I, I could have probably got probably clever enough, but I didn't care enough. Is it easier to get into the police if you've got military background? <laughs> It was then. I'm not sure if it is now. Um, when, I, when I joined the police, I had no O levels. I had one English, and I, I applied and got in. I applied for Hampshire and the Met, and the Met said yes. Oh, Hampshire said yes. You've been in a year. And the Met said yes. You come in now. <laughs> so it's a no brainer. So I said, right, I've joined. So I joined the Met in July '84. What was that like? Again, a lot of uh, more and more. I've spent a lot of fun because I haven't got a 
a negative side to me at all. I always look at the positive and the, even in the worst situations. And um, I remember going to join the place and I was 25, ex-military, and there was all these young lads around us and girls and that who literally were wet behind the ears. And I was kind of became the, the father figure to the, to, the, to the class that I was in. And went through the training school, 20 weeks, a couple of good stories came out of that, but I'll let, them, let people read them in the book because they're funny. Uh, tell me it, what, tell us one. Well, I'll tell you one. What it was, um, there's two tower blocks in Hendon, one mm. for women and one for men. And um, I'm in the bar. We had a bar on the, on the basement floor. And men and women were banned from being in the other blocks. It was a complete taboo. It was a sackable offence. So I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting at the, at the bar and uh, one of the girls passing me a piece of paper like that. And I picked it up. So I want to fuck you. Be at my room, 3.11, in the girls' block in five minutes. So I was like, oh, okay. So I folded the paper, put me in pocket. I said, I'm really tired, I've got to go to bed. <laughs> I goes back to the men's <laughs> block. And uh, gets in the lift, and two squaddies get in the lift with me, two ex-army guys. And I think, oh, fucking hell, I can't go down, I've got to go up. So I go with them until they get out, and then I get out myself and run back down the stairs. But what they did was one of them had a shit in the lift. I don't know. I said Scotty's idea of humour to have drop a turd in the lift. <laughs> Sick folks. <laughs> but I didn't know that. So I run under the block, go up to her, get to her room, knock the door on my chest. My chest is fucking popping out me, like my heart's popping out my chest. And I open the door, she's got suspenders, stockings, and a basket on. And we fuck like rabbits for a couple of hours. And then we fall in a drunken sleep. I wake up at 10 to 8 for an 8 o'clock parade. Oh, Jesus Christ. So I run down, back downstairs down to the basement, through the tunnels that lead underneath the, both the blocks, bump into the cleaner, and she faints, because she gets such a shock with me running around the corner, and she faints on the floor. And I keep running, I don't stop, I run up, get changed, and I get to parade with about a minute to spare. They do all the parade, and they're like, all the marching, and then the other the side goes, he said, right, he said, there's been something happened last night that's got to be sorted out. He said, I don't think, oh, it's me. It's me, I've fucking done it, I've fucked myself. He says, somebody had a shit in the lift. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew exactly who it was, but I never said a word. Mm -hmm. He says, that person is, we've, we said, we, he said, we've taken the turd. We're going to forensically examine it. And that man will be found in charge. He'll all be given a DNA sample or, or a sample for, for blood or something. And uh, so everyone's like, ooh. And I, and I thought, whoa, thank fuck, it's not me. And he goes, and there's another thing. Somebody made the cleaner faint when they ran past them from the women's block. And then he starts marching, the other instructor starts marching the cleaner over, right? He says, gentlemen, off caps. So we'll take our hats off so they can see our heads. And she does a full parade, uh, she does a full march up and down the parade trying to identify the person who made her faint, but she doesn't. And the drill sergeant is absolutely going off on one. And he goes to me, so meet me in my office in five minutes now. I want to talk to you. I thought, like, how can you know it's me? <laughs> but I get in there and he goes, right, he said, you're mates with everybody. He said, I want the name of the person who's shit in the lift and the phantom fucker by the end of the week because they're getting sacked. He said, do your best. I said, yes, sir. That's <laughs> fun. <laughs> Got clean up. Anyway, the guy, the, 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 a guy confessed to shit in the lift. Why? He confessed because he thought that he would, he'd be identified by the DNA two. Test. <laughs> he got sacked. But I never confessed, so I, I lived lived on. Yeah. How, what was the training like? Um, really hard. Yeah, t really hard because you have to cram a lot in. It's twenty weeks, and it's all law legislation. You have to and you have to pass an exam every week. And if you don't pass, if you pass, don't pass one, you get warned. If you don't pass two, you're gone. You get kicked out. So it's really hard. Where did you go when you passed? Then what sort? Wandsworth. Wandsworth, South London. Yeah, just up the road here. Yeah. So straight into the deep end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what? Well, you beat? Do you go the beat at the start, walking around the streets? Yeah, you have to do two years on the beat. Okay, and um, that's that's mandatory. Um, and, uh, or, and then you learn your trade basically. Um, and again, that's another. Sh it's another shop. You, what you don't realise when you're a civilian, and and by that, and by that I mean a non-civilian, you don't realise how much bad goes on everywhere mm -hmm. you know and pe people do things which you like turn your stomach you know you go into houses and it's just how can they be living here you know there's shit all over the floor all over the walls you'd be used to that we've been fucking doing the training <laughs> course <laughs> <laughs> maybe that was just a test for people to get used to it <laughs> so shitting everywhere <laughs> but it, it, it's, it's a culture shock the police because you deal with the bad in most people 
most of the time. You very rarely deal with the good in anybody. You're always dealing with the, the problem side of society. Um, and there's very, little, there's very little plus points to being a policeman because nobody really wants you there, truthfully. Mm -hmm. You know, but we, people say we police by consent. But um, as soon as that blue light goes on behind you, yeah, you're not you're not my friend. <laughs> yeah, but as soon as when I was raised in Glasgow, I was always raised to hate the police. To hate don't them. Ever, don't ever tell them nothing. They yeah. hate them. They're pigs. They're bastards. And it's only till maybe five, ten years that since I've been doing this job, when I actually speak to people and you speak to police officers, you realise how strong they are to do the job that they do and the things that they see, dead kids, dead bodies, mm. road accidents, yeah. um, abuse, rapes, like that, child abuse. But that's some dark stuff that not yeah. a lot of people would do. So I've got nothing but respect for anybody who joins the police force. Listen, there's corruption everywhere. We know it, good and yeah. bad, in yeah, every yeah. fucking yeah. job yeah. in the world. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. every police officer I've had on, every undercover copper man, I've got nothing but respect because what they go through on a daily basis and what they see is beyond people's worst nightmare because it's some dark stuff and like you say it's not a positive job it's a job of hate it's a job of destruction and pain and misery yeah. it's a negative job where everything you see is negative every court case every yeah. bad man every bad woman every bad child and it's sad as well because I always say this but just because you've done bad things it doesn't necessarily mean you're a bad person no, not at all. there's certain circumstances certain things that you've been raised or seen in your own life yep. that makes you do things that not necessarily you want to do, but you're just programmed to then think it's normal and it's sad. But so when you started on the beat, like what was the worst thing you seen at the start? The start in the first two years, the worst thing I seen was um, there's a place called Manor Fields in Putney Hill. It's a big, rich person's block of flats was back in the day. I and mean, when we're talking 1984, 85 now. And I was just, well, I used to live in, above Putney Police Station in the men's single accommodation because uh, I had a had a house in Portsmouth, but I had a uh, single accommodation down in, in living there and uh, I was awoken in the morning by what was sound like the biggest bomb in the world going off literally it shook the building where I was sitting in bed and we got called out and um, because I was older than everyone with the guys running they said right um, Rob you're in charge of property and bodies which means I was responsible for uh, recovering any property and logging it and bagging it and dealing with any corpses I'd never seen a corpse before in my life and this gas explosion that Putney Man Manor Fields had pulled a three story high block down into the basement every flat every flat was in the basement there was nothing it was leveled the, the explosion had been so big and in one of the rooms there was an elderly couple who'd been decapitated there both of them in bed by steel girders and you could see into their heads um, it was just absolute carnage and I it's hard not to I think, the, I think the thing that made me survive was I've learned over time to compartmentalise my life so although I was there dealing with absolute carnage when I went home I just went gone didn't think about it anymore but it was that was, that was, the, that was the worst thing and the, uh, the Clapham train crash was in, the, was in the same at the same time I didn't get involved in that deliberately not when that's the volunteers they didn't put my hand up because like, I don't want to be seen, or I, do, I don't want to see carnage, you know, I don't, I don't like it. But your whole life had been carnage, and I know you say you shut off your feelings and emotions where, mm. like you say, it's a little switch, switch mm. off, mm. but it's still there. Oh, for sure. It's still there. Yeah. Now that we know the science behind it and how the brain functions and operates, the brain is so powerful, we still mm. don't actually know what its purpose is 100%. We still yeah. don't realise how powerful it can be if you actually tap into it, but we know it stores everything. Yeah. No matter how smart ass you think you can be with blocking it out, yeah, thing, yeah, I don't yeah. think about that anymore. Yeah, yeah. It's still there. Well, I'll give you an example of that, Sir James, because that's very, very true. I was, I was at the tube station going to court at Subic, um, and I was waiting for the train. And I thought, there's a woman in front of me. I was standing at the back because all the pickpockets get the people at the front. If you're standing with your back to the wall, you can't be pickpocketed. And that's how it works. And also, when I was at Putney, a, a mental patient pushed the woman in the train when it came in in the station, because she was next to the platform, pushed and killed her. And then just, we, we locked him up back in the mental hospital uh, institution. Well, I was at the back, and there was a woman at the front of the fur coat, and I thought, oh, fucking hell, she must be roasting. It's a summer's day. She's got a fur coat on, full thick fur coat. And it's, the train, I'm like that. And just felt myself, kept being drawn back to her, like that. And then when the train got close, she dived in front of it, chopped herself in half at the torso, and took her head off at the other side. So she was three. She was in three bits. 
like, fucking hell. Because I was literally staring at it when it happened. And the train stopped and a, and a nurse went and looked after the driver. And I ran up to them. The platform cleared within a millisecond of everybody was screaming and just running. I went towards the train. Everyone else runs the other way. And uh, the, I ran up to the driver and I said, Are you right? and he said, she said, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. He was shaking. And you could see he was as white as a ghost. And the nurse stayed with him. And I waited at the bottom of the steps for the ambulance and the fire brigade to arrive. And the ambulance man comes running down. He says, I'll get into the train and render first aid. I said, mate, I says, unless you can blow from that head there to that body down there, it ain't going to work. I said, don't go down on the track. I said, it's not safe. So he didn't. But the reason I'm mentioning that story is because for 20 years that haunted me. You know, literally, when, I was, when I'm driving my car on a long journey on the motorway and you sort of, you've got your hand like that and the other wheel on the coffee, you slip into water part, don't you? You're not, not paying attention, but you're not 100% concentrating either. And um, when that, whenever that happened to me, she jumps in front of my car. Literally, for 20 years, she jumped in front of my car. I fucking braked hard. On, on one occasion on the M1, I did a 360 spin at 70 miles an hour because of that. Because she jumped in front of my car. So seeing, what was it like getting your first arrest when you were on the beat? Um, I was a prolific thief taker uh, because of my age. I think I, I took to policing like a duck to water as well. But I was a very fair man. For ex and I'll give you an example of that. I never nicked any bit of drink drive. Because drink drive, it's, it's a sin to drink drive. I, I get that. But all the cops did it back then. All of them. To a man. They don't do it now because it's a sackable offence and, you know, there are people there who will nick you. But everyone used to drink drive. And I used to think to myself, if you can nick somebody to drink drive, you've destroyed his life. Because if he's working for a living, he can't get there anymore. His family are going to suffer. His kids are going to suffer. So I used to say to people on the drink drive, <clears throat> look, mate, you've obviously had a good skin full. I can see that. I'm not going to breathalyze you. But if you put your keys down that roadside drain, that's a done deal. You can't drive and kill anybody at my behest. I haven't let you go and go and do that. And you, you've learned a lesson. You'll have to buy a new set of keys, 70 quid. Not one single person ever took the take me to the police station option. And I used to deal with everybody like that. I used to deal with everybody the way I want them to deal with me if the roles were reversed. Be decent. You don't, and, and I've never thumped anybody in the police. I never felt the need. I, you know, I used to say to them, hang on a minute, mate, calm yourself down. You know, we can sort this out, but we've got to do it in a nice way. We can't do it with you screaming at me. I'm not screaming at you. And that, and that made a massively impact on the way I was dealt with by the public, the way I dealt with them. And I think a lot of guys now cause their own demise, the police because they go straight in hard. And once you've gone in hard, you can't pull down. It's mad because every cop I've interviewed, they do struggle with mental health. Mm. And one of the guys says a lot of the coppers drink while on the job. Yeah. Because of the shit they see. Do you think there's yeah. enough things in place for the police to then speak about your feelings and emotions? No, not at all. It's like the, it's like the military. A lot yeah. of the homeless guys on the street are ex-veterans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, don't, I mean, I did, I did try and help homeless people when I was in, 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 in London. Um, in my area, I used to say, come on, mate, let's get you help, you know, let's get you sorted. Because every, everybody's got a story, haven't they? Yeah. I've never never treated anybody like they're not a human. And a lot of the black people, the, 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 that black culture, I would say very anti-police. I mean, the, the, the culture in the main is very anti-police. But it's not, you can change that if you, if you deal with them like they're decent people. And I used to talk to them the same as I talked to you. But, what, what, you know, he's just another man. Um, and I think the, 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 whole, the whole racism, it's been stirred up. And back in the 70s when I was a nip, and my sister um, ran away with a black guy and got married in London. You know, it was unheard of back then in the North. There wasn't many black people up there. But she broke the mold and a black guy married him and had three kids. Fair play to her. But back then, racism, yeah. Now, I'm not so sure. I think people are playing it now to make things worse, not better. Yeah, it was heavy, but back in the day, I think. Oh, it was, it was, yeah. it was literally, I mean, when I was a nipper, it was really, really bad. But now, I think if people don't like you now, whatever you are, whatever your sexuality, whatever your colour, creed, if they don't like you now, it's because you're probably a bit of a twat. Yeah. I think it still goes on. It, like, it's racism in every colour, every culture. Yeah, there is, everywhere. yeah. Yeah, I agree. But when I walk along the streets, I'm not seeing people fighting. I'm not seeing people calling each other names, this no, and that. No. A lot of people are silent racists as well. A lot of people mm. pretend that they're not, but there's... Mm still are like mm. but you don't when you walk the streets London is a bit London's probably the only city where it is a bit on you don't feel 100% safe here there's an energy about it sometimes and mm. it, it feels as if it kick off sometimes I've got mm. that feeling when I was in 
Belfast as well. I don't know if it's because of the troubles back in the day, but they, listen, mm. I love the Londoners. I love the people in uh, Belfast. They're mm. amazing. They're friendly. Yeah. They're fucking crazy. But there's always that. Everything I go with is the vibe from where I am. And there's always a, uh, maybe not so much the last few months, but the last year or two when I was in London, it always felt a bit uneasy yeah. here. I don't know what that is. There's definitely tension here. Yeah. Why do you think that is? I don't know. I mean, people people say it's poverty and that, but if that was the case, I've got a right to be tense. Yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I'm sure you couldn't have had a worse life than me from naught to 16. Hmm. I don't know. I think, I, think I think generally society's changing and not, for, not in a good way. I think, I, think, I think the way the kids are being brought up is not good. I think the, the, this, this technology, like, you know, takes, t- it's taking kids' lives away. You know, because I mean, I, I see people at three, two, four, get, get home on the iPad, four or five hours. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's the, the, the interaction skills that, that you need as humans are disappearing, I think. Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. So you're on the beat for two years. What was the steps? Do you go straight undercover after the two years? Or is there other places you have to, no, you no, have to I, put uh, in place? You have to be recommended for undercover. You can't just apply. Okay. Um, somebody has to say, I think you'd be good. So what happens, I went from Wandsworth to Chiswick. Did a spell at Chiswick, and the boss there, he recommended for, me two, for, me recommended for two posts. One was to go undercover, and the other one was for, to the flying squad at Barnes. Uh, so I applied for both those jobs and got them. Got both. The flying squad of Ruthless, huh? Flying squad. Well, yeah, they were Ruthless. Well, yeah, the well they, they've got an awful reputation from, um, from, the, from the 70s of yeah. being corrupt and fitting people up and all that kind of stuff. And that, I can't say whether that was true or false. Because they were just shooting the robbers, weren't they? They could shoot yeah, on site. Yeah, well... They, they, they had, they had, I know, because I've seen the documentaries about the porn squad and all that. I've seen them stories. And I think to myself, how the fuck did they survive in the police? Mm-hmm. But they did. But when I joined in 84, I would say the Flying Squad was a group of very professional, very decent guys. So what is the Flying Squad for people who don't know? The Flying Squad is the armed robbery squad, which, or the Sweeney, as the villains call it. It's a group of guys who deal solely with robberies on banks, building societies, jewelries. Um... And any any major thefts of big large amounts of money or gold and that kind of stuff, they deal with it. That, that's what the flying squad do. That's their remit. And there there are armed robberies every day in London. You know they're so frequent they don't even make the news. Whereas where I live, if, if it was an armed robbery, it, there'd be mayhem. You know, there'd be, it'd be in every paper. But in London, they don't make the news. And um, it, the armed robbery used to be the tough guys' crime. It was the top. You know, I used to admire the armed robbers because they were the top flight of the criminal f- criminal world. But now they're not. They're just people who've got a gun because getting guns is easy. You can buy a gun in London, sawn off for 250, handgun for 400, 800 brand new with bullets. You know, it's, the, 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 the robber now is he's not the same. He's not the skilled man he used to be. He's not, and and then before as well, which is, which is, I think, is absolutely true, they had an unwritten code not to shoot anybody between themselves, you know, but now they do shoot people. People get shot now on robberies. Guards get shot even after they've given the money up. So I think that's another society mental change. It's all right to shoot people. It's all right to kill people when you're doing your th- when you're doing your bit of work. Yeah, it's just like you say. There's no morals. Even listen, all the gangsters back in the day, there was a sort of level of respect. They even looked respectable the way they dressed. They dressed sharp. The suits, the ties. Yeah. And listen, you don't agree with what they do, of course not. They cause destruction and pain, but there's a level of respect that you can give them because no women or kids get hurt. Um, like you say, people aren't getting shot. You're not taking hostages and killing them. Now it's ruthless. Now it's a free for all. I don't know if it's from the younger school where they're dressed in tracksuits and young girls are getting killed at fucking twelve and fourteen, and it just seems <clears throat> more ruthless now. I don't know if that's because there's not as many gangsters there used to be. Where there's a level of respect and they had their their manner under control yeah, and yeah. controlled that a bit. But obviously, listen, if they're selling drugs and causing destruction as well, it's it's a hard one, but do you see the big change from the eighties to now? Oh, 100 percent. Yeah, hundred percent. I say. Well, I say the main things I've noticed is the crime is a lot more ruthless and brutal, and the police are a lot less effective. Nobody respects them anymore. No. Don't they not? Nobody cares. Nobody cares about the police, and the police don't care either. To be fair, and I, I do get that a bit because in the police, you can walk out the police station at eight o'clock and walk back in at four o'clock and have done nothing all day and nobody cares you know you've not stopped anybody not done anything not not even answered the radio once nobody says anything it, i think if they said to the police tomorrow right going forward i want a documented res- 
account of your day every day, 75% have to leave because they do nothing. So they don't document a day. It's like, I thought you had to get certain targets and get certain no, arrests. No, 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 no. Oh, and don't get me wrong. It's, it's a hard, when you start saying we're going to target people to get arrest, then you're going to say, people are going to say, I haven't got my arrest, I'll fit somebody up. That, you could yeah. say that, couldn't you? You could argue that. I'm not saying yeah. it would happen nowadays. Back in the day, yes. Nowadays in the 2020s, like everything has changed. Um, but I would say public sector workers, 75% do nothing. 25% do everything. When I, was, when I was a police officer, on my relief as a uniform cop, I arrested more people for criminal offences than the rest of my relief of 15 people put together in a year. How can that be? Well, I know it is, because people don't... Well, why, I, and again, I'm not, it's not my way, but why would you go out and bust your bollocks trying to get things done when you don't get the support of the court, you don't get the support of the system, and you don't get any more money? And you're likely to get complaints and end up losing your job. Why would you do it? It seems more sensible then we're doing fuck all. It is. It is more sensible doing nothing because you're safe then. Yeah. You're in a safe environment and you've got your 30,000 a year for, the, for your entire time you're there and you're never going to lose your job because you've never done nothing wrong. Because you're getting used anyway. Yeah, of course. You're getting used. Oh, for sure. Whether you, it's like people in the, the military, you're getting used. Whether you live or die, they don't care. No. But when you're out, it's just the, the revolving door. Someone else is just yeah, back yeah. in. Same yeah. as the drug dealers and the criminals. Somebody, family member, top boy gets took out, there's somebody straight in to replace that. Yeah, yeah. It's just a revolving system that we're in. It's like a sausage factory. Yeah. Meeting one and sausage out the other. Yeah, whole life. <laughs> so how long were you in the flying squad for? Five years. It's a five-year post. You have to move every five years. So five years maximum? Yes. Yeah. What sort of jobs were you on? Oh, um, loads. Loads of armed robberies. Um, loads of like career criminals. You know, I was on the surveillance team for a while in there, following them, um, you know, when, until they would come to the, do the, the robbery on the security vehicle outside the bank, and then we'd attack them um, with the guns and overpower them. And that would be that. They'd go down. They'd get off a of court. They, they nearly all got off a of court. What's that feeling like from military kind of on the radar sitting mm. in your ass to then flying squad you're then holding a shooter you're mm. then sitting behind robbers who are who are tooled up as well shotguns mm. whatever they're using mm. what was it like your first job to go it's in the adrenaline rush for the, on the flying squad when you're following people and they're going to rob a security van and you're going to hit them afterwards as soon as they've done it it's, just, it's a massive adrenaline rush it's like, it's like it's, for, the, for them as well I think it's a massive adrenaline rush and they're a complete flop to the floor like you know because they've suddenly they think 15, 20 seconds we're going to be millionaires and we're behind them thinking 15, 20 seconds you're all going to jail. Have you got snipers on the roof as well? If it's, if it's necessary, yeah. When do you hit them? So somebody's got to rob the bank. When do you hit them? Do you hit them when they're going to the bank, outside the bank, walking in the bank, walking out the bank? What sort of evidence have you got to get? Because if you're going to hit them before they go to the bank, they can say, well, we weren't going to the fucking bank. They may get done for their gun, but it's not the full conviction that you want. So how does it plan? The, 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 the best way, uh, which I would, if I had been in charge of an operation, would say, well, let it run. Let it run like we're not here. Because it would happen if we weren't here anyway. If we weren't particularly behind them at this time, it would happen. But it's a balls of steel job for the person in charge because if they shoot one of the guards, if they shoot one of the tellers in the bank, there's, there's a world of pain coming because you let it happen. But if you don't let it happen, and this is why I said about the acquittals are so high, if you bowl in while they're outside the bank, just about to do the work. And, you, and I'll give you an example. We had, we had three guys that were, they were being found security um, delivery at Acton. Three good armed robbers, seasoned armed robbers. And the boss didn't want, to, didn't want to let them hit the van when it came. So as soon as the van came, he called a strike. And we hit, hit them, because they were in the van behind where the van was going to park. They were going to come out with the balaclavas on everything and hit the van. We hit them just as they start to open their door of their van. They get the call. Oh, no, we weren't going to rob a security van. We've had a guy called Johnny Wilson. He's been robbing the pensions of their pension books. We were going to frighten the shit out of him. That's what we were going to do. We weren't going to rob the van. You, no, we charged him. No, we, 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 you know, we weren't going to do that. We got off. Smart. You can only get charged with conspiracy if they've caught with the planning of it and the details. But I think nowadays with technology and phones, I think there's so much information that people can get caught easily. Um, it's definitely easy to catch them. The tools are there to catch people now. Yeah. You know, when I back in Mayor Ben, Ben, was in his infancy when I was in the police, we used to say to him, well, don't want to get some surveillance photographs, go to the Facebook page. 
Yeah. <laughs> go to Insta- yeah, it wasn't in, but Instagram now, you know. Go mm-hmm. to Instagram. You'll say, I'll, t- I'll tell you where they're going tonight or where they're going to be. They've already accepted the invite. Yeah. Right? You know, so there's ways, we're detective ways of doing that now. But yeah, it's, um, the, the system is, is the, the legal system is fucked because it's not designed to convict anybody. It's designed to acquit. Did you ever shoot anybody in the flying squad? No. <clears throat> Did you ever get shot at? Yeah. What was that feeling? Um, it's fear. In fact, I'm going to clarify that a bit for you, James. It's absolute fear to be there to do the job. You know what I mean? There's, there's no, it's not, uh, there isn't a policeman in the country, I don't believe, who actually physically wants to kill anybody. It's just not in our makeup. It's not in our psyche to kill people. And, um, and, and take, it takes a special kind of person to kill somebody and not have an, an impact on their emotional well-being. It does. You know, you know, it's not the norm. And um, I, 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 I'll give you an example. We, we were outside a bank in Tooting, and um, the first three guys nearest the arm rob when the, when the strike went in, they fired. Two of them missed completely, and one hit him in the leg, and they were this far apart. Because it's not natural to go have it. It's, not, it's just not a natural feeling. They, 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 even the military... Back in the day, they, they used to, when they had the muskets and that, they've done surveys. They, the soldiers couldn't kill. When they recovered their weapons from the battlefield, they had like eight bullets, eight bits of wadding, eight bits of gunpowder in it. They hadn't pulled the trigger. Even though the boss had said stand and fire, they hadn't done it. It's not an easy thing. It's a, it's a frightening, horrible thing to kill somebody. Yeah. I think serial killers and killers, they've got, because a lot of the killings in prison as well, a lot of people have done it on high on alcohol and drugs. Because I spoke to an SAS soldier and he says over ninety percent of people hold a gun miss. Yes. Because it's the shaking and you're, you're yeah. all over the place to be ruthless and cold hearted and cold blooded to gun in that frame of mind. There's something I miss, like you say, with your psyche, with your feelings, your emotions to be that stone cold killer. Yeah. And I've interviewed snipers, but you can see the damage that they've got in their mind because yeah. it's not a humane thing. No. We shouldn't <clears> be seeing destruction of other human beings. That's why a lot of people come back from military or the wars, their heads are gone because yeah. the screams, the shouts, the yeah. dead bodies, you've seen that girl yeah. in the train and at your car all the time. It's not normal. Well, the, well, the army and the police changed their, ta- their targets. We used to shoot at a target with nothing on it. But they changed them so when they turned, you'd see a man. It would be a photograph of a man, obviously, be a man or a woman or something, and you'd shoot. Because they, 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 even the army thought their own men aren't shooting to hit, to hit even though they're trained and they've done all the courses. When, they, when a real person is stood in front with real eyes and looking back, they can't do it. See, for your intelligence, for to catch these people before they get into the bank, is that through snitches or is it through your own intelligence and certain things over the years? All sorts. I would say, you know, you do, you do, you do get informants talking about armed robbery. You do get just people, sadly or gladly, whichever way you look at it, a lot of criminals brag about what they're doing. And it gets to the wrong ears and they say, well, so and so is doing a bit of robbery. He's, he's had it off. Well, you know, if he's doing a robbery and he's had it off, when the money was out, he's going to do another robbery and have it off. Mm-hmm. So you just got to follow him. What's the, who's the most, who's the biggest bank robber out there that you've, you've seen in your time? The biggest bank robber. Um, <clears throat> uh, I wasn't, do you remember the Easterbrooks? No. Uh, he, he, they got shot um, at the abattoir. I wasn't on that job, but I was in the job at the time. But the two, two guys who I respect because they're completely professional robbery. And, and I, if I think if, you, if you're going to be a, if you're going to earn money from armed robbery, live in a nice house. Live, live well. If you're going to take the level of risks that's going to get you 30 years, live well. Don't live in a council house with no money and not a pot to piss in. What's the point? You know, you, you're putting yourself in office 20 years jail and all you're getting out of it is peanuts. Go big or go home, basically. Yeah. How much were they making back then? How much was the, the banks and stuff having? Because everything was cash back then. Was, I'd imagine it was more now, more then than it was now. But Well, the, mo- the most of box holds is 15K. Yeah. And that's what you're going to get. If you hit the, hit the guard on the pavement with the box, the most you're going to get is 15K. But I've seen people get away with free, free grand in coin and go to prison for 20 years. Imagine getting free grand in coin. Yeah. One team in East London, they nicked a security van, the whole van. They got three million in coin. Absolutely useless. You know, so you're going around with fifty pound bags of pound coins when you go for dinner with your missus. So they get three million pound worth of coins. Yeah. <laughs> How heavy was that, man? Cunnage. <laughs> I 
talking tonnage. <laughs> yeah. But they got caught because they kept going back to get the pound coins. <laughs> Same as a kid in Glasgow. He, he robbed a bookies for like 120 quid, got 11 years. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like people, it's not smart. I talk about him in the book. There's a guy called David Ewins. Okay. He was a career armed robber. Really hard man. Had a fearsome reputation in jail, never mind outside, on the outside. He robbed a post office on Hammersmith Bridge Road for 300 quid. He came out. The old bill were passing, in an, an armed old bill were passing by chance, and they shot him dead. 300 quid. No Razor Smith's a good friend of mine. He, he got out of prison for a robbery yeah. and went and straight out of prison, just went in and done a bank that day, got a McDonald's bag, put it over his head and, and robbed it. Mm. See, for things like robberies in the 70s and 80s, see, because they're older now, could they still get done with them now, even though it was like 40, 50 years ago? I don't know. Uh, because it, it, the, the Yanks have got statute limitations, haven't they, where you've got a certain amount of time to charge somebody with a crime mm -hmm. after the event. I don't know about England. I've never really given that any thought. Yeah. yeah I, don't, I don't know. So you says you are undercover and flying squad at the same time. How could you do both? Well, because uh, un undercover work, you can dip in and out of it because... You don't have to be there all the time. So like, one of my first jobs undercover was to buy three kilos of heroin for, for some East, from some East London gangsters. And I was on the flying squad at the time. And, um, and but Ben mind, I'd done two years in uniform at Wandsworth. So I, uh, I go to meet the guys and a uh, guy comes to meet me and I had a long hair and a ponytail then. And he goes, this is a Turkish guy. He goes, I, I knew as soon as I saw you, you were a drug dealer. I thought, why? <laughs> because I got a pony so <laughs> but so anyway in, I got him to we started talking about the free kids and, and the, all the intelligence was that the, the guys were from East London but we get in the car where does he drive to? Garrett Lane Wandsworth to the Spotted Dog pub where I, which I'd raided not less than a year earlier <laughs> for drugs <laughs> I was sitting in the car fuck me this is going to get naughty <laughs> I can't get out of the car <laughs> but anyway he ran in brought the next guy back in the, in the food chain to, uh, who was offering up the heroin and uh, he got in the car with us and, and I recognised him from the pub but he didn't recognise me and I was sat there and I'm telling you what, I had beads of sweat rolling down my back <laughs> and I thought, when I got up I bet the seat of the car was wet how but, was that feeling for going undercover did you feel you could create a new character for yourself and be something different especially the upbringing that you had, yeah, where it but, felt new, felt fresh, and you didn't have to be that scared, bullied little yeah, boy that you yeah, were. Yeah. Does that come into play? Yeah, but I mean, I would say definitely it, it helped me to, in all my personas, my my council house background. I, I, I've seen like, like a few of your podcasts, and being in a council house, having the shit upbringing, makes you into a strong person. Or either makes you or breaks you, one of the two. Mm. You know what I mean? Or you go off the rails. My, my, my best mates at home, who, who was friends of mine all from my childhood, he died of an overdose. And everyone, got life for arm robbery mm -hmm. seeing you go undercover why don't they take you out of your borough or the area that you were just so it's more clean cut where you've got a fresh image instead of being around where you can take the risk and get took to a pub that you've actually raided like yeah. that's a massive risk it is it is and it, it works it just works that way um and it never caused me any grief at all um bent cops caused me grief like uh, saying i know him he's a cop when i when i was working um, but no, it never caused me any, any grief at all. But it was a, it's, a, it's always a worry. Bent coppers, was that people on the pay? Oh, yeah. yeah. Is yeah. there a lot of like corrupt coppers? I wouldn't say there's a lot. Um, in, 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 I was undercover 70 years and I found two. So that's not really a lot. Um, I think I'd have found more if there'd have been about. Mm -hmm. But um, to me, if they, if they said to me, right, Rob, we're looking for somebody to execute bent cops, I'd sign up. I would honestly, because the, the, one of the guys who dobbed me in on a job, if they'd have been any different kind of people than the ones that they were, they were decent gangsters, they'd have just took me to one side and topped me. So that bent cop for 50 quid, 100 quid, could have seen the end of my life. How do you end up going undercover for 17 years without your cover being blown? Was it ever close? Only when, only when somebody else said, like two jobs I did, which are the ones I'm talking about, and in the, in the book, where a bent cop... Drove, drove past the wine bar where I was with the, with the villains, where we were sat outside. He said, I know him, his name's this, his real name. So that job killed that, killed that job. And another job, I went, I went to Vegas to infiltrate some people uh, from the UK. And a guy back in England said, there's two undercover cops trying to catch you. Beware. So how do you then, so 
when you get a target, so do you get paperwork to say, okay, this family's doing gear, they're shifting? Because the coppers know everything. I think everybody knows now that they've got a rough idea of what people's doing, what they're moving, how much money they have, mm. especially with the technology, bugs yeah. and the surveillance that everybody's got. They know everything, especially with informants. But back then in the 90s, what sort? how would it work? How would a job work? Do you get sheets of paper, photos to say, okay, target this family? And how does it start? Well, I was, I was probably the, the, the infiltrator for the firm, really, because I can walk into a place cold. If you said to me, right, Johnny Briggs, the best armed robber in the world, drinks in this pub. I could walk him. I could be his mate within a week. I was really good at that, and that was that was really my forte. I was the most people need somebody to push them in, an informant to push them in. I used to go myself, befriending people. Just just go in the pub, sit down, have a fag, have a cup of tea, have a beer, and start talking. And, I, and that, that was that was definitely my forte. I could I could talk to anybody, anywhere, anytime. And it didn't matter how hard they were. Or who they were, if they if they were if they were in there, that, that we'd be friends. Does, al we? does alcohol make the job easier? Because people loosen up a bit and they're kind of relaxed and you feel <laughs> as if you've got something in common um, in a pub. No, I would, I would say that the thing that makes it easier is making people laugh. Yeah, for me, I, mean, I, used to, I was a comedian. I was funny. Being a class clown, kind of. Yeah, that class so clown mentality. Kind of burning your life set you up for an undercover job. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, yeah. And um, I, I, there's nothing as well which people don't like to admit, but I liked all the people. I liked the villains. <laughs> so we, we, uh, there was some of them. I'm telling you, I liked them more than my personal friends. <laughs> I did. I felt, I felt like Judas when I, when I, when the, when I pulled the plug on them, mm -hmm. because I thought I, me and you outside of this world, we could be proper mates. We'd be like a team, you know. How is that? Because I think Donnie Brasco. He he befriended the guy, and I think they were pals. And I think he did feel a bit gutted that he had to pull the plug on it. How? What's the longest job you've worked on where you've grew a bond with someone? Two years. That's a long time. Yeah. How does that make you feel when you know? Do you know what made me feel the worst? Two, well, two things made me feel bad. The week before we pulled the plug on the job, the guy says, "Come and meet me for a drink. We know we got to talk." And I goes, "Yeah, what is?" He goes, "Look." He says, "You know, I love you like a brother." He says, "I want you to be godparent to my son." I was, oh, that'd be lovely. But I thought, knew, I knew I couldn't do it. But it really hurt that he, wanted, that he liked me that much, that he wanted me to be a godparent to his son. And then at the end of that job, we got like commendations from, um, from chief constables and that saying, oh, well done, great job. You know, you've, you've done a lot of good work there. And then his wife rang in and she said, oh, we, can I just say I really like you? <laughs> and we, we would have been friends if my husband wasn't a crook. I thought, oh, that's very nice. <laughs> When you go undercover for two years, like what sort of, how big an operation is that, and why is it took so long to gather so much information? Well, that particular job was in Essex, and it was um, there was a massive problem with drugs and coke, and uh, they said we need something to go and deal with this. And that, what what basically happens is the the team who are running the job they might be doing it on an overt basis, they might be gathering intelligence, and, all, and they request to deploy an undercover officer, and then the undercover control center would say well who do you want and you know what kind of person do you want and then they say well somebody can do this 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 and this and i'd say they say well we think that's rob that's rob street so on that one it was moving to a council estate get myself a flat live there work the estate effectively you know, basically be a resident and then start going to places where the drugs and guns were really prevalent and that's what i did so i started that and uh, sort of 12 months in I had to meet out of hand, all of them. Were you buying gear and guns off them? Yeah, yeah. Sniper rifles, shotguns, handguns, cocaine, large amounts of cocaine. <laughs> not, not for me, but for, for evidence. So you say, Rob, <laughs> maybe, maybe that's why your head was fucked, mate. You're sitting in Essex sniffing your brains out, shooting fucking bullets through the ceiling. <laughs> well, no wonder you love the, the job so much. On, on, on that particular job, right, we, this guy goes, he says, he says, come and meet me at the pub. We've got some brilliant stun guns. One of my mates who was another undercover was already there at the pub. So I walk in and the pub, pub's chocker with people. And they're, they're playing pool and they go, over here quick. So I'll come in. He goes, right, we've tested these on us. We need to test them on you now. So we started zapping each other with these stun guns in the pub. And like the, so one of them was so powerful, it actually knocked me off my feet. And the people in the pub were like, these guys are nuts. And that, that's how it was. It was, it was fun. Another time, the, the, guy, the same guy, who I love to pieces, John, his name was, he, um, 
He says, I've got, I've got a gun for you. I said, all right. He said, I said, we're going to meet. He goes, come down to Tilbury Docks. I said, all right. So I drive down to Tilbury Docks to see him. We go in. And he's, uh, he says, get, go, go in the container there. We can't be, let it be seen here. So I go in the container. I'm like, in the, in the container, in the pitch black, like that, with the door shut. Next minute, he opens the door and he goes, boom, <laughs> lets it off in the container. Fucking hell. And I went, what the fuck was that? He goes, nice, isn't it? <laughs> No sound. <laughs> so I was like, I could tell you now, I've had to put my pants in. Right? <laughs> and then he did. And um, anyway, I said, so when, the, when he opens the door, the light comes on and he's fired at a piece of uh, marine ply down the other end. And it had in it, it had the, the, in the shot, it wasn't a, a shotgun cartridge, it was a shotgun cartridge with a ball bearing in it, a full size ball bearing. And it ricocheted around the container before it stopped. I thought he could have killed both of us. Stupid bastard. Yeah. So see, what sort of, like, clothing? Did you change your hairstyle? Did you get rid of the ponytail? Did you grow a beard? Like, did you change different characters? I just changed names. That's Ch that? Names and accents, yeah. And, and skills, because I was a boat captain as well. What about with the name calling and somebody... Did you ever get somebody call your name and you just blank them and you you forget who your name was? Well, no, I mean, this is another, on, the, on the Vegas trip, but we were infiltrating a gang of criminals who were in, importing puff by lorry from one part of the country and I, I mind me in Vegas go to watch a football match on the big screen walk out the door with me mate and this guy goes ow I thought, oh, that's my name because I use I use a different name on every job and I use the same name twice and I look around and he was a, it was a leader of a, another criminal gang there and he goes what are you doing here I said, I come to watch boxing it was the uh, Lane Exclusive Vander Holyfield fight he says come on me and the boys are going down the stratosphere to ride the hotel uh, ride the uh, um it's called the roller coaster on the roof, and then we're going to go to the chicken ranch and fuck some whores. He says, You're coming. I says, Yeah, I am as well. So I go to my mate who's like that, not very happy because he's not that confident. Whilst we see him off and we get in the taxi, there's me, my mate, Paul, the gang leader, and his underling in the front, and another taxi with another four of them in it. Anyway, the guy at the front's trying to get Paul's attention and he calls him a cunt. Paul grabs him by there from, from the back, back to, into the back of the taxi and bites half his nose off like that spits in the football and throws him back in the front seat fucking blood pissing everywhere he says get out the fucking car sends him out and then we and we, and we still drive to the stratosphere to go on the roof <laughs> and my mate is as white as a ghost and he's, and he's, he's going to me <laughs> and we go up to the roof and must have, even I was thinking no, I don't really want him on the roof of the stratosphere hotel with a guy who's just bitten his mate's nose off but um we got went up there. They got the top. The, the guy at the, the top goes, "Oh, sorry, that's it's too windy. The the ride shut for an hour. Go and have a drink at the bar and come back." And I said, "Oh, we can't wait, Paul. We've got to go." He goes, "Oh, no problem. It's giving me, it gives me a kiss and a hug." Goes off. Me and my mate get back in the lift. When we got back in the lift, he was shaking like a shitting dog. He was. <laughs> have you got to wear? When do you wear a wire, or is that just movie stuff? I know you always have to. Every time. Yeah. Is that is that not a danger when you've got the wire on? It, it is. And it isn't. It is because you've got it on, but it isn't because if you think about it from a villain's point of view, there isn't a bigger insult, is there, than me sent you? Where's your wire? You've got to be a brave man to say that, haven't you? Did anybody ever say that to you? No, not once. Do you think that's more stupidity from criminals to not being overprotective of saying, let me strap you down? Um... I think I think it's uh, you get you, you you get two kinds of criminals. Those that are easy going, don't really worry about. Never think they think they're uncatchable, untouchable, untouchable. And then you get those who are absolutely paranoid, and it's counterproductive paranoia. Yeah, because yeah. you, you end up stripping down people who are not boss. Yeah, do you know what I mean? And then you get your head kicked in. <laughs> did you ever have anybody saying there's something off about you? No, I did. The guy who was with me because of his shoes. They said I don't like your mate. He's got cop shoes on. <laughs> You can sense that sometimes with a pair of fucking shoes. I can always spot a copper. Yeah, another well, one. I say I always can, but back in the day, you always had the vibe because they're never happy. They've got the seriousness about their yeah. face and you could tell with the way they walked. Yeah. Everything was suspicious. <laughs> um, I was, I'm, I've always been good at reading people, always been good at yeah. listening. Sometimes you get it wrong because there's people who are, who are good at their job and this and that, but I would always be over paranoid. Mm. And that could be a bad thing, but also can be a fucking good thing yep. because you're always on it. Sometimes you get it wrong, you lose friendships, you lose loved ones because you're paranoia, maybe yeah. a bit extreme, but yeah. 
You better safe than sorry. Absolutely, I yeah. agree with you hundred percent. I would be, and I've got to say, on a, on a job, one of the guys goes to, to one of my mates. He goes, <laughs> he says, you know what? He says, you could be the regional crown scot. And my mate goes, yeah, I am. And, the, and it went deadly silent. <laughs> and then my mate burst out laughing, and they all laughed. But he was. Yeah. <laughs> no, I've got nicks. That's sick, mate. <laughs> <laughs> You're a better stuck, <laughs> <back> stuck mate. <laughs> the thing is, they pleaded at court, which I didn't want. I, I didn't want them. I wanted to plead not guilty so that we could play the tape with them saying we think the reason I'm crying. Yeah. And him going, yes, I am. <laughs> How is that feeling? Have you ever came across anybody you've done? Since? Yeah. No. Never? No. That's mad, that, isn't, isn't it? it? Yeah. yeah, it is. I, I nearly fell a foul once. But it hadn't been done. I was on the job in a part of the country, like 100 miles from home. And I walked up the curry house out a mile from my house to get a an Indian takeaway. And in there was one of the guys from the operation under miles away who'd met a girl at, in a club in London and come down to see her. Goes, what the fuck are you doing here? I said, what the fuck are you doing here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I was stood there thinking, if Ali, the owner of the restaurant, comes out and goes, hello, Mr. Soul, <laughs> I'll be fucking dead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> See, when you're undercover, what's the, what sort of limits have you got to, if somebody says, look, shoot this gun to practice or shooting targets or take this bit of gear or shag this hooker, where's your limits for being a copper and, and to not blow your cover? Again, when I was in, um, it was different. And there's been a lot of high-profile cases of guys who've shagged the targets, haven't they? On the, you know, particularly the eco-warrior guys, where they're getting the girls pregnant and everything. When I did my course in 1992... If you had sex with anybody on the job, you charge a rape. Because she's not consenting to sex with you. She's consenting to sex with the person she thinks you are. So it's effectively a deception on the woman. So the rule of the day was, you don't fuck them. That, that, I never fucked anybody on any job, ever. What about snuff? Nah. Like, well, again, that, that's another myth. Um, because at the top end of the food chain, they don't. They don't sniff. You know, we only dealt with the top end. We, we, I wouldn't go in against a gram dealer. I'd be, they'd be sending me one out of a kilo, two kilos of Charlie. Those guys don't sniff coke because they think it's fool's paradise. Yeah, they're making money from people. They're making money from them. It's a bit, to them, it's a business. It's just a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a computer. It's just a thing. It's not an actual thing I want to play with. And they take users as liabilities. Yeah. You know, you're a liability because if you're using gear, you might get nicked and then you're going to tell somebody about me and it's a mess. Because I had Neil Woods on, he was undercover, but he had to take a bit of speed and he was out his fucking nut, but he was bottom end, <laughs> mm. undercover, um, not with his job, but he was like a, buying cheap drugs. Like, well, what there is, is there's three levels of buying. Okay. There's street level gram drug buying, no training required, eco warrior and um, football who infiltrations, some training, but not enough. And they, they got basically basically got disbanded. The football who were in training because they couldn't write evidence. They were thick as shit. Yeah. And then there's the um, level one undercovers, and that, that we, we had a criteria we had to that had to be satisfied before they could even call us. So it had to be multi kilos, large amounts, big jobs, guns, explosives, that kind of thing. I was trained with explosives and everything. What's the biggest job you were on? Uh, that 300 kilos of coke. 300 kilos. <laughs> That was the biggest. But I've, I've, I've smuggled people by boat for criminal syndicates. I'm a boat captain as well. So, and they said, this is, a, this is a story which makes me smile and it's relevant to what we've got to say. And right now, the big thing at the moment is um, people smugglers now across the channel. And they're all on the telly, all the government officials, all the politicians, everybody saying, we've got to stop these evil people smugglers, these gangs. There's no gangs. There's some patsies who get stuck in because they can earn a few quid. The people sending the people across from France are the French government. I know that for a fact. I'll tell you for why. Because I was asked to, by a Turkish group of guys who, who were bringing people in by lorry if I'd bring 20 illegals from Belgium for, um, for money. I said, yeah, of course I'll do that for you. So I went and hired a boat for £1,000 a day and I went, went to Ramsgate to head, head across the channel when the time was right. And throughout the process, the... European government were prevaricating about whether we let this happen or not. And they've been absolute twats. And then, day before, I'm, I'm getting stressed from the criminals now, you know, get, the, get your ass over there, they're waiting, they're waiting, they're waiting. There's 20 of them on the, on the side on, on Belgium. And the day before, the boss rings me, he goes, <clears throat> he says, Rob, there's a problem. He says, they want you to give a full safety briefing 
when the illegals come on board and issue them with a Department of Trade standard life jacket each. Right? Now, I, I was undercover 17 years. No criminal syndicate gives a fuck whether you make it or not across that channel because you've had your money. You've paid up front. Doesn't matter. They will not be forking out on shiny new red life jackets for every boat person on that boat. And that's what's happening now. Every person coming over this channel now on those boats is wearing a Department of Trade issued life jacket. And that's a government stipulation. That's not a people smuggling stipulation. That's not a criminal stipulation. Criminals don't give a shit. So when you talk about people smuggling, is that human trafficking? Human trafficking, yeah, yeah. How bad is human trafficking in the UK? Again, I never, I, I never really got involved in it, I would, so I don't know. Um, but I was involved in smuggling people and drugs across the channel by boat and lorry. And it, it's, the, the way it's being portrayed at the moment is not right. Those people are not being smuggled by criminal gangs. They're being smuggled by governments. So see when you're like, smuggling people over in, in the drugs, is it one big shipment or have you got to keep the operation going to gather more information for criminals, the big families and the people who are smuggling 300 key over? Like... Is that you got everything that you need? Does there more to the full story and get gathering all the evidence? No, with Jem, Jem with, 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 with an undercover officer being deployed, you get the evidence as the job progresses. You don't just go, you know, like, for, if, if, for example, I'd meet somebody, he'd say, I want you to move some gear. And I'd go, yeah, well, how do you want to do it? And then he'd say, I want to do it. And then I'd say, well, I can do that, but I need to get this, 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 and this. I need some money. And they'd pay some upfront money. And then somebody else might come along, higher up the food chain to be happy. To like you know, make sure they're hunky dory, and then you'd go off and do it. Pick up whatever the commodity was, whether it be three tons of puff, twenty keys of heroin, fifty keys of heroin, three hundred keys of Charlie. Come back as soon as the people pick that gear up. Need. When does entrapment come into play? Entrapment comes into play if they're not involved in that course of action themselves. They they have to be. You can't deploy an undercover and set a job up. Mm -hmm. that, that, that we don't do that in the UK. We don't do any. Um, that kind of stuff where you, where you, like I've heard in America, they set the gear up and everything and then bring the people into it. We don't do that. In, in us, it's always got to be, you've already got to be involved in the course of conduct before we, before we can deploy an undercover. So they've already got to have the operation in play? They've got to have the operational intelligence in play, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they've already got to go, they have to write a report and they have to back it with another meeting and say, right, well, what's, where, where, what's your evidence and where's your strategy? So you couldn't go to someone and say, look, I've got 100 kilos of smack there. I can get you at a good price. No, huh? no, it, it, no, this wouldn't happen. And the problem with it, it, when, when people talk about corruption, the big problem with corruption is, for, for me, is what's to stop somebody snitching on me when I'm corrupt and setting me up? Because the old bill do set the old bill up now on traps, on undercover traps. Mm -hmm. You know, they try and catch bent old bill with, bent, with, with undercover old bill. So if you're undercover, they'll put people undercover to try and trap you? Not, not, not an undercover officer. But if they thought it was Ben, yes. If they, if they go in from, say for example, and this is a hypothetical situation, well, Rob's undercover and he's working the lorry and he's bringing back 300 key of Charlie, but he's banging 10 key on, from top, on top for himself, they'd get me as well. Mm -hmm. They'd put somebody to get me. When you're undercover then, like, what's the hardest part of being an undercover agent? Um, home life. The sacrifice that goes sacrifice, with it? Sacrifice, yeah. I mean, I've got two kids. Um, they didn't really know me for 18 years. You know, they knew that I was their dad, but I was awake too much. My youngest daughter, I haven't spoken to her for three years. You know, she's a lovely kid, but we don't talk. Do you see a bit of yourself in your own dad? Um, no, I don't, because, because I did really try hard, knowing how bad it was for me as a child. I, I try and balance it off as much as I can. It didn't always work. But I did, I did a lot of time. Like, for example, if I was in an operation and uh, I wanted to go and have four, a week away with missus, I'd just say to the villains, I'm going to wait for a week. Bye. Mm -hmm. That's acceptable. Nobody's going to say, why? Well, no, you're not. So I'm, I'm, I'll try and balance the whole off. It's not easy, but you can make it work. How can you switch off from being a character for one person to then being a family man? How Because... Obviously, with this method acting as well, isn't it? Like where your Daniel Day-Lewis's and your Jim Carrey's and he went 
I think it was Andy Hoffman he played, but he stayed in full character and it kind of nearly lost him his job. People were losing respect for him because he was just so ingrained in being that character. Mm. When can you switch off from being an undercover copper, working with criminals, buzzing, surrounded by mad guys, which you, which you loved? Mm. Um, part of you probably wanted to be that guy or was that guy as a young kid before you went to the Navy, but to then kids at home, misses, how do you switch off? Can you ever switch off? I think I, I, I did. I think I did. Oh, I say that you don't. You don't know 100. percent But I did. I think I did because I used to have. I, I got on the on the job where, where somebody identified me as a police officer and gave him my name. I thought I can't stay in London now. I've got to move because there could be a bang on my door one morning and it could all go tits up for my family. So I moved down to the south coast, and I used to think when I passed the M25 going home, I commuted for 15 years to the south coast from London for work for peace of mind. Uh, when I got the M25, it was like, I'm home now. That, that one and a half hour drive shut me off from work. What was your lowest moment in the police force? I don't think I really had any low moments in the police force, to be honest with you. I absolutely loved it. It was a great job. Um, I think the police let, let me down, but they let me down since I left, not while I was in. How? Because well, when, um, again, this is another story in the book, but I'll, I'll give you the briefest details of it. Back in 2008, we went on to Turkey and we met a waiter, a um, Kurdish waiter in the restaurant. And he says to us at the end of the season, oh, you know, can I talk to you over email? Uh, you know, because you've, you've been good customers well for the time you've been here, blah, blah, blah. So he took our email addresses. He didn't email me. <laughs> he emailed my missus. And he just started talking. Oh, how's it going? It's hot here. Blah 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 blah. This is happening. That's happening. You know, talk about the bars and the restaurants and the, and the people that we knew. And over time, he was in. He was starting to chip, 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 chip away at her. And then she'd he'd say, uh, "Where's Robin?" She'd say, "Oh, he's at work. Oh, he's always at work." And that's and then she he started to plant seeds into her mind that she was getting a raw deal. And she and probably she thought she was as well. To be fair. And then one day he says. Um, I, I go into the where our computer's at home and she shuts the screen down and I realise something's not right. So when she goes to bed, I log it back in again, pull up the MSN screen and read the conversation. And it says, she's basically saying, you know, you know, you should leave him, he's not your type, blah, blah, blah. Why don't you come to Turkey and live with me? Now, she doesn't say yes, but she doesn't say no either. She doesn't say no either. So what I did was I bought a, um, a, a bug programme called Spectre Pro off the internet, which bugs every computer in the house and everything that, she did on the computer I got sent to my phone literally every every email every conversation and over three or four months it just got worse and worse and then we were due to go on holiday in the August of that year to Turkey um, and uh, he said he, he said it, she, she said she was coming and he said oh well, can you bring some money because I've got no money and she said yeah I'll try and get some here and that and then he said I really I'm in love with you where's this effect and she, he said, when, we, when you come, can we have sex? And my missus goes, yeah. And that was the terminal point of my relationship with her. And um, the long and the short is he, he continued that and he kept, he kept taking money. She was giving him money, literally. And she, he, she, he treated her awfully, which I'd never done. But I thought, well, there's no way I'm going to blow this affair open right now because my kids are doing their exams at school. It's going to fucking be a world of trauma. I've got a world of work on my plate to deal with as well. I don't want to have a fight with my missus right now. So I never told her, let her carry it on. Let her, let her keep it going. And, um, but it was stressful. Reading like reams and reams of disgusting shit about me from him, which he wasn't batting off, was awful. So I started boxing. I was a martial arts instructor and I've, been, I've got three black belts in three different styles of karate and I've been training for 30 years and I can have a tour out, I can have a row. I don't like it, I don't like a fight, um, but I can have one if it's need, need be. And um, I started boxing. I'd never boxed in my life. I was 50 at this point. I was due to retire in the year. I was 14, I was due to retire in the year. And I started boxing and I'd become really good really quick. And I started getting taken to take part in shows around the UK, white collar boxing shows. And I'd go there and I'd have a fight and be massive crowds. And then one day there was a fight on and um, 
Oh, yeah, there was a fight on, and uh, I went to the training session the week before with the boxing club, and the trainer goes, oh, nobody's come in, it's just you and two of us. He says, what we'll do is we'll have a, we'll have a sparring session with the pro boxer who's next door, doing some shadow boxing. And he, he marches in, the trainer goes, right, the rules are, you're not allowed to hit them, but they're allowed to hit you. But it's like perfect training, you're getting away from the people who can't fight, and they're, they're trying to hit a guy who can fight. So the first lad goes in, three rounds of dancing, no problem. I go in there, martial arts trained, bangs him on the nose in the first 10 seconds. He was a lovely, lovely guy, and I don't hold him any, any hurt for this at all. He hit me back eight times in a millisecond. Head, body, head, body, head, body. And I, when I came out, the, when, I, when I actually like, got my head together, my, my, my brain was shaking. And I got out of the ring. After I'd finished three rounds, I was well, fucking that wasn't very nice. I didn't like that. <laughs> I made a laugh of it. And then we went home that day and I had a headache from that day to the following Saturday. But the following Saturday, I was fighting at a big show and all my family and friends and brothers had paid £60 a head to watch. Uh, 60 of them. So I'm outside waiting to come in for my fight. And um, I've had seen the doctor. The doctor said, anyone with me? I was no, I'm absolutely fine. But literally my head was banging. Waits outside. Guy comes in from the red corner to eye the Tiger Rocky. Starts giving it all that. Jumping about, then there goes uh, uh, out the blue corner is Rob Soul. He's fifty. He's our oldest fighter today. Crowd starts booing. Fuck off, bollocks, load of crap. And I then uh, came out to um, I, one foot in the grave, Victor Meldrew. <laughs> so, right, I fucking I jumped in there, but I was fit as fuck. Literally, I jumped over the ring, threw me top off. I was fucking ripped. And the compere goes, fucking hell, gents. This is going to be a fight. <laughs> and me and this guy had a three round tear up and it was deemed a draw in the end. He was 30, I was 50. Um, it was deemed a draw. But afterwards, we normally go lap dancing, but I goes, I can't go. I'm really, really poorly. So I went home and lay down in bed on the Saturday night and woke up the following Thursday. And my head was literally thumping. So I went to QA hospital and they said, you've got a bleed on the brain. And they treated me with some blood thinners and everything and sent me back home. Said, it's rest. You can't go on holiday on Friday. Where are you going to go? You've, you've got to get sorted. But then I went into a complete depressive state. I became completely depressed. And I dropped from 13 stone of solid muscle to 10 stone of skin and bone. My head was fucked. I couldn't think. I couldn't drive my car. I couldn't go anywhere. I became a recluse. I didn't leave home for two years. I never left the house. I grew a beard. I stank. Everything stank. My house stank. I didn't, I didn't eat proper food. I was an absolute mental wreck. The doctors came to see me, put me on venlafaxine, 1200 milligrams, which is an antidepressant. Didn't touch me. Tried to kill myself four or five times, cutting through my femoral artery with a knife. So, so painful when you start to slit your skin with a carving knife. I couldn't do it. And now that might be because I didn't want to either. I didn't push hard. I could have probably pissed harder, but I didn't. Whether that was some inbuilt thing in me not to die. I just couldn't get to go through the whole way to the artery. And, um, and then one day, after about two years of not going out and not seeing anybody, I it says, Rob, if you can't kill yourself, you have to get better. And at the time, I had an, uh, an in-ground swimming pool at home in the back garden, big, quite a big one. And it, was, it had gone green. It was full of dead animals. It hadn't been touched for two years. It was rank. I emptied it with a bucket over probably the course of seven days, emptied it with what? With a bucket completely cleaned out the lining refilled it with water got it working again i felt absolutely elated so i went to see my doctor i said i'm feeling better at the time i was eating a bacon baguette and wearing a superman onesie now he should have realized something weren't right there yeah you can that's when you know you're depressed so anyway he said oh we'll keep taking the tablets and come back later so i went away but the tablets because i was on a what's it called that starting the mania phase of a, of a depressive episode were making me high. And I literally became a raving lunatic. Off the scale, nuts, violent, looking for fights everywhere. Going out in my car, I had a Mazda MX-5 sports car, roof down, two o'clock in the morning, doing 130 miles an hour in 30 mile limits, breaking and the, the discs were red with heat. And pulling in front of blokes, cars with blokes and going, get out of the car, I'll kill every motherfucking one of you. No reason at all, just because they'd been there. 
And eventually my daughter goes, I think my dad's gone nuts. And she reports me to, to the local mental health team and they send a couple of people to see me. By this time, I've smashed all the bathroom tiles out in the bathroom. I've smashed the bath out, I've smashed the sink out. I'm living on a mattress on the floor. I've bought thousands of pounds of useless gear on credit cards, which I didn't really need. And um, a guy, uh, this guy is my hero because he saved my life. His name is Skip Bauer. I'm going to publicly name him because he deserves every credit for it. Uh, Asian guy. He, goes, you know, I said, oh, he said, Mr. So, we've come to talk to you about your mental health. I said, I'll tell you what, you if you don't fuck off, I'll knock both of you out. Now fuck off. So he came back with a couple of cops. I said, look, one of you sets foot towards the threshold from where you are now. I said, I'll beat the living fuck out of all of you. Now fuck off. Next minute, full tactical team outside my house. Firearms, everything. And they s smashed the house in. Nicked me. Took me to Basingstoke, so I came to the intensive care unit. And, um, and I was nuts. And I'm not, no, 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 do, do, I was absolutely off the scale nuts. Nuts beyond that you could comprehend you could be nuts. Um, but, but extremely violent as well, which wasn't me. I'm a, I'm a timid guy. I'm a mild guy, really, when it comes to fighting. I, I can fight, but I don't like to fight. I'd, I'd rather say, hi, how you doing? Have a point. Um, but I got lucky in there. And in there was a, was a, a guy who spoke with a Rastafarian accent. And he said, hap on back to him, but he was white. And he goes, charming blood, rotted bumper clock. And all this stuff. So I was thinking, mate, you're getting right on my tits. And one night, the, um, the woman who was in charge of the ward at night, she goes, um, he says to her, oi, bitch, get me a cup of tea. So I went, fuck that. I fucking leaned across over. I said, who are you talking to, you piece of shit? Fucking took his out, slapped him around, gave him a right backhand slap around the face, and he fell off the chair on the floor. She pressed the alarm. The riot squad turned up. I turned them over, the three of them. And then I went in the kitchen, I had a um, carving knife and an extinguisher. I said, anybody comes down, I'm going to fucking kill you. Next thing is, full tactical firearms team, dogs, everything, at the hospital. Eventually they tasered me with two tasers <laughs> and carted me off to Thornford Park in Newbury, which is a Priory-run hospital, but uses an overspill from Broadmoor. And I spent three weeks in a padded cell, being injected daily by, and they, I wouldn't let them have me, so they had to get eight men with shields, they had to beat me, and then they'd spin me over, jab me up the arse, leave me there for another three days. And I just stayed there, and eventually the drugs calmed me down, brought me back down to, to a reasonable level again. And then while I was in there, in the, in the, in the padded cell, I was allowed out for exercise in the yard on my own, and the window to the next ward, which is basically a prison, it's not, 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 not a hospital, it was full of insane criminals. One of them was from the um, Burger Bar. Have you ever heard of the Burger Bar boys mm -hmm. in Birmingham? One of them was from that gang. He said, oh yeah, it was in, it was two, it was, we're, the, we're the Bookerbury gang, there's, there's 12 of us, two, two black, 10 white. You know, it's, it's, it's mean in here, mate, it's fucking mean. So when they came to me, when I was feeling a bit better, and the, guy, and the doctor goes, oh, we're going to put you on the Bucklebury ward. <laughs> I goes, are you fucking serious? I said, you're going to put an ex-cop on the Buckleberry Ward with 12 insane criminals. He goes, what's the problem with that? I said, mate, you're not real. I said, there's only going to be one outcome. Either they're going to kill me or I'm going to kill them. Which one do you want? So he said, you need more time seclusion. Lock me up for another week. <laughs> so anyway, eventually they, they put me on the ward and I spent a week on the ward. I spent a week on the ward, I spent three months on the ward. But I, I, I decided, what, I was sane enough to, this, to, to bring in a persona non-military, non-police non, non, non -police persona, said I was ex-Navy, I had a dramatic divorce, blah, 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 and, um, and I'm a boxer. But while I was in there, the, 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 the most important part of the story for me is, firstly, there's no care in there whatsoever. There is no care at all in, in any of their mental hospitals, contrary to what they'll have you think. Secondly, the drugs are dished out and they're swapped, literally. On, you know, people with, with taking back in drugs for schizophrenia, give them to people who've got treble schizophrenia. It's, it's just mental. Nobody takes their tablets. They sell them for fags and sweets, swap them. And when I was in there, I met a guy called Julian and I got really pallid with him. He was 65, I was 50. I said, what's your story, Julian? He goes, well, he says, when I was 13, he says, I got took into care. Me and the, my mum couldn't cope with the kids. I goes, oh, okay. He says, and, um, we got sent to care, and as a protest, they said, I set fire to the curtains of the care home. 
He said, I've got three years in Borsal, arson with intent to endanger life. He said, in there, he said, I was 13, pretty. He said, I got raped every day by the bigger lads. He said, the only way I could stop the rapes was to make a homemade knife and stab them. But instead of them getting done for raping me, I got done for GBH in them. He said, so I got more bird. He said, I ended up on Parkhurst on the Isle of Wight with Ronnie Cray. Ronnie Cray says, Julian, you're a very pretty man. And for the duration of your sentence here, you'll be my wife. He said, and he beat the fuck out of me and raped me every day. Literally beat me to a pulp and raped me every single day. Violent sex was his thing. He says, and then one day a girl comes on the wing. He says, he's a nonce, paedophile. He says, you're going to kill him. And Julian says, when, a, when Ronnie Cray gives an order to another inmate, it's not a, not a request, it's an order. He said, so I cut the bloke's throat with a knife, but he didn't die. He says, so, but I got lifed off, criminally insane, without parole. He says, I'm 65 and I've been inside 52 years. I cried. I literally burst into tears. Now, I can't tell you if that's a true story or not, because... People made up stories about why they were there because they didn't want the truth to be coming out. And plus they're psychotic. Plus they're psychotic as well. So I can't say that's 100% a factual story. But when he told me, that he, he said it with all sincerity. And I looked at him, I, was, I just got fucking hell, mate. 52 years and you've not seen daylight. And when he said, he said, Rob, if they said to me tomorrow, off you go. He said, I don't think I could. He said, I've never seen a plane fly. I've never seen anything. He said, my life's been on standstill for all those years. And all I've been is abused all my life. He said, what will I be like outside? What kind of man will I be? I don't know. Ronnie Cray was a nonce. He was a, well, yeah. he was a horrible bastard. Yeah. He was, when he got jailed, he was in bed with a 14-year-old or a 13-year-old mm -hmm. boy. Like he was, these people shouldn't be glorified. Listen, yeah. I'm all for gangsters and maybe involved in that life but to harm kids you're a fucking you're a you're a wronging he was a proper wronging yeah and i don't get why they say you can rehabilitate somebody that's like saying i can rehabilitate me and you to prefer men to women it just can't be done whatever you prefer you prefer yeah you can't say to somebody no from tomorrow you won't fancy kids you're going to fancy women again yeah. it's not going to happen i've never never wouldn't dream of fancying a kid so were you telling your story and all the trauma that you've been through <clears throat> like i say the brain stores everything mm. do you think because of all the shit you went through, you've you've had it well. You've became a karate expert. You've been undercover. You could play different characters. You've had all the trauma your whole fucking life. Mm. But then, obviously, your missus having an affair. Do you think that was a trigger of releasing every single bit of it? I definitely had a lot to. It was definitely stressful that time of my life. Yeah, yeah. And why? I don't, I don't regret her having the affair. And I'm going to be straight with here. But why? She did me a massive favour. Yeah. But what I'm seeing is when you're telling me that story, why did you not? treat it as a husband instead of an undercover cop because you went in full investigation of what she was doing why not jump on it straight away because it's like you were working on a job instead of being a husband and saying listen you're your fucking slag you've yeah. been caught <laughs> yeah. fuck off why did you put yourself through that pain and torment of looking at those messages being called this and that her agreeing to sex like what was going through your method of thinking? Because for me, it's like you went full undercover instead of being a husband. I would say I definitely did use that skill at that time, but the reason behind it was, was calculated. It was because I knew <clears throat> I was due to retire in one year. I knew that this relationship wasn't going to go away. If I confronted her at that time, it wasn't going to go anywhere. So I decided that I would stay the way I was, negotiate a deal that was good for both of us, but not, not, not mullering me and my kids and, and do that. And I, what I did, I did to protect the future of my kids. Yeah, but that's torment and misery and pain, and it's you've lost at the end of it with putting yourself in the mental ward. And, oh, yeah, yeah. And yeah. The, but, I mean, I, never bear in mind, I never anticipated that. Yeah, of course. <clears throat> yeah. So when you've ended up staying in yourself, becoming a recluse for two years, did she go to Turkey? No, no, because before that happened, when we got divorced on the, 10th, uh, the 1st of October 2010, and on the 1st of 2000, 2010, 1st of August, I was in Turkey, fronting him up. What happened? Well, he, So you've went and seen the guy who was trying to have an affair with yeah, your wife? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, basically, he worked at a bar, and um, I walked in there. He was with another woman, holding her hand. Um, he let go of that and jumped a mile when he saw me. And uh, I said, right, I said, all I'm going to say to you, mate, I said, you can stay there, love. I said, all I'm going to say to you is, 
your relationship with my wife is over. Do you get where I'm coming from? Your relationship with my wife is over. You will not be getting another fucking penny. Because you'd give him quite a bit of money. And the woman who was with him slapped him and said, you thieving bastard. He's only taking money off her as well. Anyway, I said, who's the owner of this bar? He said, he's out there. I said, which one? He said, the guy there. So I there's five guys outside, all thick set, leather jackets. And I knew they were crooks, just by their appearance. I said, excuse me, are you the owner? He goes, yeah. I said, can I have a word in private? He goes, yeah, of course you can. What is it? I said, I said, I'm not talking to in front of your friends. <clears throat> I said, you see that guy over there? He said, oh, yeah, that's my, my nephew. I goes, that guy there has been stealing money off me through my wife for the last two years. I says, it stops today. I, I, I need sorting today. Now, I'd like you to sort it, but if not, I'll sort it. I said, but I'd prefer you to sort it because you're, you're, you're his kin. So he pulled him over. He gave him a massive backhanded slap. He says, get two, a bottle of JD and two glasses for me and Rob. And I went and sat down. And he says, you speak this fucking man's wife ever again. He said, I'll send you home in a fucking box. He says, you're my nephew, but you're a disgraceful cunt. <clears throat> and I sat with him and drank with him for an hour. He gave me his mobile number. He says, I can tell you now, he says, he says, I'm the head of the Kurdish mafia in this town. He said, if you'd have come in here, fists flowing, gob working, he said, you'd be fucking dead now. He says, all of my men out there are armed with guns. He said, and they'd have shot you dead. He said, but you came in like a real man. You came in talking, not making a scene, not showing my, me up. He says, because of that, I respect you. He says, and you'll never come to harm in my town. If ever you need any help anywhere here, there's my number, phone me. How much did your missy send him? Thousands. Why was she so gullible to it? I'd, I'd love to ask her the question, to be honest with you. I just don't get it. She sent him thousands, literally. And on one occasion, on one of the messages, he, he said, bring 5,000 on Monday or I'll beat you like a dog again. And I thought, again? You beat her like a dog again? I never beat her once, ever. Never even for shelters, her, probably. And, How old was she? Um... She's seven years younger than me, so she would have been 43. How old was he? 30. What do you think that was? Do you think that was lack of... Listen, she's in the wrong, but do you think how much does your lack of affection come into play? Because you said at the start that you, you shut off your emotions with all the shit that you've been through. Do you think you were missing something from... You can't have a... Listen, someone who cheats are wrong in all mm, fucking yeah. aspects, but for your own perspective and in your life and choosing the police over family, mm -hmm. even though you didn't want to, because everything you probably did was. For your family, I don't know, mm -hmm. but how? what do you think was missing? Do you think for her to crave that from some young kid talking shit, who's plain, to, plain for anybody to see that they're obviously manipulating people who get in the bar and seeing targets, but yeah. what do you think was missing in your relationship for that to then I, go like that? I don't know, but I, what I will say is this, and I think this is quite common generally amongst married men with kids. I don't know a single married man, married man, over 40, with kids, who has sex with his wife. Not one. Not one. Now, I don't know why that is. I don't know if it's because the kids have come along and it's just, not, it's, we're done, we've got the kids, we don't need the sex anymore. But to me, the sex is what binds you together as a couple. Bond. Bond. It's the bond. It's the love. It's the real love. And it, when she was writing to him online, and he, 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 she said, oh, when I get there, I'm going to suck your cock and lick your balls and all this sort of stuff. And I was thinking, we used to do that. <laughs> I did, honestly. <laughs> I thought, what went wrong? <laughs> uh, and it reminds me of a joke I heard once, and it said, how do you stop your girlfriend from giving you a blowjob? Send someone from Cumberland. Marry her. <laughs> Marry her. How do you stop your girlfriend from giving you a blowjob? Marry her. I don't know how the fuck you control that. I don't know how you control that. Mm. I genuinely don't know. A lot of men would fucking kill their wife, if I'm honest. That is the ultimate level of disrespect. Men crave respect, women crave attention. But yeah. for you to then look at that, there must be something wrong with you up here as well. For oh, you, yes, for sure. For you to go yeah. through that. And, I'm well, not being, been, yeah. and, I, and I respect you to a high degree with mm. your honesty, but yeah. I've got to be honest, there's something tapped yeah, for yeah. you to be yeah. accepting that. Yeah, and, and, and I agree with you totally. I think there's a coldness in me from all my years of abuse as a child, that perhaps I never fully allow anybody into me, 
into my close you know, into into the here. Yeah. Um, I'm with a uh, with a girl now, and I've I've dedicated the book to her. Her name's Jane. Her husband died at 52 of cancer, um, and and she's the best woman I've ever met. She's the only woman who I've ever thought. You're, you're what I wanted in a woman from day one, from the minute I was a child. What I want in a woman, you are it. You're everything I want in a woman. And I was, I've, I've sort of got, got a thing where I say there's three types of people in the world. Givers, takers, and piss takers. And everybody fits somewhere in there. And she's a giver, and I'm a giver. I like to give love, give cuddles, cry when it's crying time, play with the kids, run like an idiot, be an idiot. But, and, and, but there's also a dark side of my personality as well. I know for a fact, when they, when they recruited me um, to, do, to do the suicide bombing killing, they knew I could kill. They knew that I'd walk up to somebody and put two bullets in the back of the brain so and not breathe a heartbeat and not sweat and not worry about it and go and have a cup of tea. And that's why they recruited me for that. I was recruited for the suicide bombing killings back in the um, late 80s. And what's the suicide killing? Well, basically, like, remember John Charles de Menezes? Yeah. Do you know the story? No. Well, basically, John yeah, Charles... on the news, though. Oh, John Charles yeah, yeah, was, yeah. was on the news massively. Yeah. But what basically happened was, and this is, what I don't, this is why I don't go with conspiracy theories and all those things that people say about, about what's going on in the world now. Because for me, if I was the prime minister of a country and a guy flew in from the Lebanon, hell-bent on going to work with a suicide vest, what would you do? You knew he's coming. You knew he was going to wear a vest. You knew he was going to b blow people up on the tube and What would you do? Yeah, kill him. Kill him before he gets there, wouldn't you? Of course. You break into his flat where you know he's living. You've got his address. He's in there. You've got the place bugged. You send the SS in at Freedom One, slot him with a silencer, cut him into pop and feed him to the fish. That's what I'd do if I was the Prime Minister. But we don't because we're civilised. We're a civilised society. So what we do is we leave him there and we set up a job on him, a surveillance job. And we have an, op an observation point outside the block of flats where he lives in South London. And a guy comes out and the man who's in the, with eyes on with the binoculars goes, yeah, yeah, target number one's out of the address and he's left, left, left. Now, as it happens, John Charles de Menezes was a pretty good lookalike for the terrorists from the Lebanon or Algeria, wherever he came from. He was a good lookalike. And the guy in the observation point got it wrong. End of. But from that point forward, John Charles Mendes starts walking with a rucksack down towards the tube station. Command structure. If he goes near the tube or the bus, kill him. That, that order is given by, the, by Gold Command. That's it, it's done deal. What happens? John Charles Mendes, he goes to, to the tube station. He doesn't pay for a ticket. He jumps the barrier. So he starts running down the steps. The two guys behind him, what I used to do, my job. Not me though, them. Run down after him. Gets on the tube, one gets behind him, two bullets to the brainstem. Wrong man. Heartbreaking for John Charles Menzies' family. I, I agree, heartbreaking. But should have been dealt with last week when the guy arrived. Trying to fight terrorism within the legal framework is like buying a chocolate fire guard. What happened when they killed the wrong guy? Well, it was a big inquiry. They were, they were suspended from duty. You know, there was talk of charging him with murder. <laughs> it's fucking bollocks. There's a guy, there's a policeman waiting to stand trial for murder now. Did you know that? No. For shooting somebody. Now, for me, I, was, I carried a firearm for work, and I have a simple attitude around that, James. Whether you, believe, whether you like it or not, I don't really care. If I'm carrying a gun and I'm pointing it at you, do as you're fucking told. That's it. Because I'm going home tonight. And if you move one finger, you're getting it. And I don't mean that in a horrible way. I mean, the difference between life and death for an armed man is that. That's how long it takes to kill somebody. And you haven't got time for that. And when you're, when you're in a firearm situation, it's mad. It's fucking mentally, it's exhausting. Your tunnel vision, the sirens are going, there's noise, there's people screaming, arm oh, please, arm oh, please, all that shit. That, anybody who says they can have a casual thought about that is taking the piss. There's no casual thoughts going on in anybody's head. You're reacting to a very, very awful situation. And if a police officer shoots somebody, it's not deliberate. Nobody gets that gun in the holster, goes on duty and goes, today I'm going to kill some fucker. They just don't, because we're not made like that. Humans mm. aren't made like that. 
obviously when some people break into people's houses as well and the, the house owners kick fuck out them or beat them with a bat or stab them I've seen them go to prison yeah it's mental why is that it's wrong What's the so what is the self defence law in the UK well you can defend yourself to a reasonable amount what's reasonable what's reasonable to me and what's reasonable might be two different things yeah I mean, it would be, wouldn't it? Because you all deal with things based on your own perception and life experiences. In Florida, if you step forward to someone, if they've warned you, and in Florida you step forward, they can shoot you. Mm. Their laws are different. Yeah, I know friends who carry guns and they've got, I forget what the law's called, but if anybody, if they pull a gun out and say, look, don't come any closer, and soon, if they go as close as an inch, they can shoot them. Yeah. For me, the big problem with, with our side is we're all spineless. We all want to see the, you know, people... Mullered, whether it be politicians, celebrities, police, you want to see them mullered. You're not happy with them just getting told off, or you're not happy with them being, with being dealt with properly. You, you, you want their throat all the time. And um, it's going to be, this country's going down the toilet. A million percent, <laughs> even with the tax and stuff as well. And yeah. um, how the, it's the corrupt government and everybody in lockdown and they're all partying at Christmas as well. I don't forget that shit. People couldn't see their loved ones and babies and, and they're all partying Christmas. Well, they, do you know what that, what that was? I wrote to Boris Johnson then. Uh -huh. I said, Boris, stop talking on the TV because you're lying. I said, I can see your lips moving. You and my, Mancock. I said, you're both liars. You don't believe it. You don't believe that it's as dangerous as, this, as the scientists are saying. Just say that you don't believe it. Leave the country out of lockdown. Let, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying there wasn't a pandemic. I'm not a denier. I'm fully triple jabbed. But it, 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 was, it, wasn't, the it wasn't the millions of deaths that was predicted. It never was going to be. It never was. You know, me and, me and Jane, we fucking ignored it all. But has that not scared you how fast the world can get into lockdown? Yeah. you think that was a dummy run for what's to come in the future? Well, again, I mean, one of my mates is big into all that. And, um, and I've, I have a laugh at him because for the reasons I've said, like, you know, I, I don't think that, that we're that coordinated as a group, anybody. And the, and the problem with, with the conspiracy, my brother's a builder. He goes to New York, he says, oh, I've been to trade tells it was definitely a knockdown by the Americans with explosives because he knows his structure. I says, all right. I said, oh, James, I says, let's have a chat. I says, I'm going to organise a knocking down the Twin Towers. I'm American. I go to my mate, James. James, do you fancy knocking down the Twin Towers and killing 3,000 people? What do I do when James says no? What do I do? I've got to kill James. What about when the next person says no? I've got to kill that guy as well. So when you're going to do something, you, 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 everything, everything, every, every venture of any nature, whether it be criminal or thing, needs cooperation from a group of people. And that's why a lot of people are in jail, mm -hmm. because they talk to the one person who they shouldn't have, and they all yeah. fall shit up. I'm not saying they didn't know that it was coming, the Twin Towers. I think every bit of intelligence, I think every, for that to be as extreme, it is a possibility, but then you look at... Iraq as well, weapons of mass destruction. Yep. There was no weapons. Lies, total lies, yeah. The media can portray whatever they want. Yep. And people believe what they see. People yep. believe what they read. People believe what's yep. out there. So your wife, anybody, people can be manipulated sure. easily with certain words. You've, yeah. you've done it your whole life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Undercover. You've yeah. manipulated everybody that's come into your life to a certain degree yeah, as well. Yeah, without a doubt, yeah. Yeah. So it's fucking easy done. Yeah. And as human beings, we are quite thick as well mm -hmm. yeah if you because everybody does stay in a bubble where they don't ask the questions yeah i like to sit back and go listen i'm not a scientist or a doctor whether the earth is round or flat i don't give a fuck whether <laughs> the twin towers or whatever i genuinely don't know the only thing is it questions me is why would they do it mm. what's the bigger purpose is it yeah. money is it greed is it yeah. just sick individuals who've got so much that they just want to destroy other people's lives mm. with vaccines or flus or whatever pandemics they've created Every, every so often there's a new war. Yeah. Every so often yeah. there's a new plague or there's a new destruction yeah. of the planet. Mm. The patterns are there to see that, okay, something might be amiss. But mm. for me, I concentrate on me, my life. Yes. What Boris Johnson says or what everybody says, I don't give two fucks. Me not. They don't control me. No. Yes, they can have a say in your schooling, your upbringing, system that you're in. Life is a system. Mm. It's the same system. So I just like to question it and try and have as much fun with it as possible. I don't have all the answers. I'm not a fucking guru. I'm not a conspiracy theorist because I just question everything because I don't know. I yeah. can re read, watch a couple of videos, read a couple of books and go, ah, that's interesting. Human beings just go towards what makes them feel right, but it doesn't make them right either. No, no. So you've got to question that. Yeah. What do you think of the system in the UK, the system that we have? Of, of what? Everything, schooling, I think police all, force, I think it's all bent. Well, no, government. My view on the police is the police are lazy. They need to make it not a job for life. 
They need to need to review them every year, and if they're not good enough, get the fuck out of them, kick them out. I, would, I did 25 years in the police. Not one person was sacked for not performing. That's got to be bollocks. <laughs> every other job I've had ever since, if you're not uh, making your targets, you're gone. Sorry, mate, you didn't sell 10 houses, you're gone. Sorry, mate, you didn't do this, you're gone. This, it, it, only the public sector, you can be fucking bone hard and survive. Can't be right. That's why the bills are. That's why the NHS is so expensive. The NHS, yes, some of them work hard. Most of them don't. Fact. Mm -hmm. I don't care what they say. I've, I've seen QA, um, the casualty department, 25 ambulances stacked up a year before the pandemic. Yes, we need, we need, the NHS needs sorting. The police need sorting. They need to get rid of all the dead wood. They need to get people motivated. They need to start thinking about, for example, in the police, the most important thing is budget control and not a complaint. What it should be is catch those fucking criminals who are causing society the most damage. And if you get a few complaints, so be it. Budget, well, everyone has to have a budget, but let's use the money wisely. You know, drugs, forget drugs, legalize them. It won't cause one more person to use it than uses it now. All my mates use coke. They're all Charlie heads, all right? Why do they use it? Because they can and they like it. Why do I have a drink of lager? Because I can and I like it. We're in Colombia, a kilo of cocaine, how much? 500. It's 1,500 now, 1,500 quid. In the UK? Yeah, 30, 40 grand. 35 to, 32 to 35,000, right? Cut down to pieces. I'm not in a game anyway. <laughs> I don't know if you are, you're undercover here. You could be just but, no, a plan. <laughs> Listen, go and ask him questions. Just let's see what it is. I should know. Yeah. I should, I should Who's just, doing this yeah, interview? Yeah, yeah. I don't know the price of this. Who says? Anyway. I slipped into the old character there. You're good at your fucking job. So, you? so anyway, what I was saying is <laughs> cocaine, 32 to 35,000 a kilo, cut to shreds as it is in the UK. Yeah. 200,000 pound. Big profit. Mm -hmm. Massive profit. Now, cocaine, the average street seizure of cocaine, 11 to 20% pure. 20% gear. 80% Novocaine or yeah. baby's milk for master. Yeah. Or some other powder mix. Nothing, that, no cocaine effect whatsoever. No, no, no high, no fuck all. Yeah. So I've, I've, I've bought cocaine for 17 years and only three people sold it at the purity that it arrived at. Only three. Everyone else cut it to shreds. Mm -hmm. So people are getting high on the thought of it and a bit of it. Yeah. They're not getting high on a 75% hit, yeah. or even though they think they are. Everyone says it's the greatest gear in the world, but it ain't, it's shite. No, it's push. Yeah, it's piss, yeah. yeah. So the only, the only drug I'm dead against is heroin, because heroin is a positive, 100% a, a killer. Yeah. Kills bodies, kills heads, kills everything. But coke, all the other drugs, recreation. Fentanyl, that's a big one. Yeah, yeah, it is. But the, we, we, do you not see this as well? Though? We're, 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 the government is saying you can't have that. But the prescription drugs are equally as damaging, yeah. which you can have. I think as a human mindset, I feel as if everybody should be in a, a normal state, which is natural in life, which mm. is exercise, cold water, eating the best of foods. But we live in a state where people are lost, people are confused. Mm. Everything that you take externally that takes you away from a conscience frame of mind is an escape. Mm. So the only ones, listen, I've tried all drugs. I'm drinking drug free now for many years, mm. but the only ones, I think MDMA has a lot of, benefits to the mindset i believe yeah weed listen it's still a depressant but it's probably better than most yeah um alcohol if you can fucking maintain it to a, a couple but we don't because we're greedy yeah. all over the world <laughs> and it's the feeling of taking away your pain yeah. it takes us away that's why listen that as i don't drink because it takes me to cocaine it takes me to lines to yeah. anger violence i didn't yeah. like because sometimes i would be a good guy on it and sometimes i'd be evil and angry and yeah. Um, and I, I didn't like it. It had power over me and control of how I felt, how I think. And um, I just believe there's any, everything grown from the earth. There's many because heroin and cocaine's a plant. It's mm. just obviously how it's manipulated to then how people make them yeah, feel. Yeah. Same yeah. as. But when you think of the, you know, the anger and angst it causes, the the movement of it, you know, the yeah. shootings, the, the stabbings, the violence. If it was in the chemist. Wouldn't matter, would it? But that's why they don't want to legalise it, though, because then the police force would numbers would be off. There wouldn't be court cases. There wouldn't be prison systems. Mm. There's forty grand, fifty grand per inmate mm. in every prison. It's a money making scheme. It's billion dollar industry. It's a trillion dollar industry. Yeah, I'm sure. yeah, yeah, and yeah. Uh, yeah, it's hard to if you take away drugs, then there's no violence. Take away alcohol, there's no violence because people sit, they get drunk, they get full of ideas, mm. and then they cause trouble. You never yeah, see yeah. people fighting really sober. No. 
unless they've got a good set of balls and you know he can handle himself. Mm. Like I've interviewed enough people to know mm. who's game, who's and who's full of shit. I got mm. a lot of gangsters on. I know they're full of shit. Mm. Um, I'm not fucking daft, but it's just there's so many ways to make the world a better place. But I feel as if we're so far the other end of the spectrum. That I don't know if I'll ever see it in my lifetime with those big changes. No, I can't see us pulling it back. And that's why yeah. I've, I've, I've sort of adopted the lifestyle of it. And I don't mean this in a selfish way. I mean, because it's about me and the people around me. My, you know, my wife, my, my girlfriend, we're not married, but my kids, my, my kids are massively important to me. How yeah. many kids have you I've got? I've got two girls. But I said one of them hasn't spoken to me for three years, but that's yeah. because her husband came over. She married a guy from Turkey. He came, comes over. I, I, I let him live in my house. I give him a job. And he fucking shits on me. What the fuck is it with you in Turkey? I don't know, I don't know. Why the fuck are you still going to Turkey every well, time you've went there, you've had issues? <laughs> I don't know. Because at least in Lebanon, <laughs> fuck going back there. No, no, I've I cut no. my steps on and I fucking, I wish <laughs> to fucking, fucking get a well, grip. It's, because it's, it's like it's, you're going back for more pain. It, 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 don't it, be it, taking your fucking girlfriend there by your means. She's been loaded up. <laughs> You'll be sitting on a podcast next year <laughs> just out a fucking broad more. Lost the third girl that you've loved in your life. Uh, yeah, but the, 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 I always... The thing is, you can't control your kids falling over. That's the problem, yeah, isn't it? Of course. She didn't go there with me to meet him. She met there on her own holiday, met him. She says, and you know what it's like? You, you talk to him, oh, I've met a guy. What's he like? Well, what? oh, he's uh, he dancing on the bar. Yeah, he's a fucking stripper. Oh, oh he's dancing on the bar. And has he got a house? No, he's got nothing. Nothing at all. No house, no car, no money, no fuck all. Oh, that's a good start. But you love him, I'll support that. Yeah. And that's the way I am. You love him, I'll support that. But he's turned out to be an absolute ass, And he treats her worse than any white man ever would have any other man family's everything for me yeah and me i've too. got kids to different women and it is a pain in the ass if i'm honest kids are getting to that age now they don't really want to spend much time with their mums and dads and um they feel as if they know everything yeah. and i was the same at that age i was a smart ass mm, yeah um so i get it but everything i do is for a better life for my family and kids but there's a lot of disagreements and people say oh i love my family and i'm happy with my family Family are hard work. Yes. Because it's the worry. And I'm a worrier as well. And yeah. I know how the world operates. Yeah. A lot of people are stuck in a little bubble, 95, and don't really see the destruction. Yeah. I've interviewed a lot of people abused at kids, raped, and fucking, and it breaks your heart. Like my daughter, I don't have it, let her have a sleepovers, and she fucking hates me for it. But I don't know who's in that household. Exactly. It might not be the mum and dad. It could be the brother. It could be the uncle coming in, the creepy yeah. cunt. Yeah. I yeah. don't know. Sorry, yeah. I said cunt and I promised. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you wouldn't. K Katie, that I would I'm banned from saying that word. Yeah, I promised my good friend Katie that I'd stop saying it. So sorry, Katie. Um, <laughs> bastard. Uh, I says it twice as well. Yeah. Uh, listen, it'll. Um, but yeah, life is life. But see, when you were in the Looney Band, seeing you were in the, the white padded cells, how many visitors did you have? None. Do you know as well? That, and that's, I'm, I'm glad you raised that point because I did say I, you, I was access to a phone when I was in the, in the loony bin. I rang the serious organised crime agency who I worked for at the time when, when I left, who should have looked after me. I said, "Look, I'm in a loony bin, surrounded by insane criminals. Please move me to a military hospital. I'm going to get killed. I'm going to die. Not a peep." And they actually banned everyone from coming near me. And I thought. I've given you the best years of my life, you cunts. And all you've done is put your head in the sand and turn the other way when I'm in trouble. And I've been, up in the 17 years, probably 10 to 20 life-threatening situations where I could have died for the job. And not one person was allowed to come and see me. Not one. How much does that make you then question that you were used? Oh, I was. But I, I, to be fair, I always knew that anyway. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I, was, I knew from the military that we, 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 you were here for a purpose. Good up on. And, I, and I've always made myself the best life I can for me, what I want, with the money I've got and the people around me, and I mix with the people who I like and I don't mix with the people I can't be asked with. I've, I've got a real problem with liars. I can't stand the liars. And that's why my daughter's husband, I've got a problem with him because he just lies 24-7 to everybody he meets. I just can't be doing that because I, 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 like, I don't mind a thief. A thief, he needs it. He, might, he, he wants it. A liar, he's, he's just spineless. He's a spineless man. When was the moment for you, Rob, that you knew your life was fucked? When, when, was, the, when was the penny drop? Because if you're filled with 
all the shit they're injecting you with and all the pain you'd lost your missus mm. when was that moment because you're a strong guy you've like you say what you've come through in life and what you've overcome <laughs> to be successful takes massive balls as well but when did you know you were at your lowest and okay you were you were you were you needed help well at the lowest is when i was on the appeal hearing to get out to get out right i appealed to get out because that's obviously over three months i became quite sane again i got my ability to talk again i had a communication but the ward was violent and dangerous. Mm -hmm. And I knew when I appealed, if I don't get this appeal, I'm not going to survive. I can't do another year of this. You know, a year living a lie again because they all thought I was a, in, in the Navy and a boxer. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I, I, eventually it was, the, the, the ward has goaded me about it, letting them know I was a cop to keep me in line. Do you know what I mean? And um, they, they baited me on it. The, the people in the, in, the, in the ward, and I thought, I'm not going to live another year. For that. And I, that's why I mentioned Skip Bow by name, particularly. Because I said to Skip Bow at my address when, he, when the raid went on, fuck off, you or I'll kill you. Right? And he went. When they had the appeal hearing back at um, Thunk of me to leave, they fought tooth and nail to keep me. They said I was still insane. I was still capable of extreme violence, blah, 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 blah. Regurgitate the shit from when I, from when, when I came in, how I was. And the judge on the appeal hearing, he says, well, he said, we're having real difficulty here. Um, is, is Mr. Bauer here? And, and Skip Bauer was there, because if I was going to be released, it would be into his care. He said, Mr. Bauer, said, we're having difficulty here. Mr. Soul's not presenting as a maniac or a lunatic. If you saw him now in your town, would you section him? And Skip Bauer, if he'd have been a spiteful man, bearing in mind what I said to him, if he'd have said, oh, we definitely would, that would be me gone for years and dead. That would be me, that brown bread, 100%. But he stood up and he went, no, sir, I wouldn't and I couldn't. He's perfectly normal now. And bear in mind, he's an AMT, whatever they call them, the mental health people, and they've had two consultant psychiatrists saying I'm nuts. He says no. They said, thank you very much, Mr. Soul, you're free to go. That was a, was a moment in my life I'll never forget. I cried, I hugged him. I ran back to the world, got me a case, fucking ran out. Literally, he saved my life, 100%. I'll never forget that man as long as I live. And what was that feeling then from coming back into normality where you've not got your wife anymore? I don't know if you were through divorce or all the way through it. No, but... all finished, yeah, yeah. So what was that feeling then starting from scratch again to figure out who you were and what you were about? Everything, yeah. Re total, total rebuild of my life. I was, a, I was an absolute wreck for the first 12 months. Not, 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 a, not, a, not a mental wreck, but an emotional wreck. What do you think that is then? Do you think that, like I say earlier, would you think that was just the head of it all? Just everything that you went through as a kid, just everything your whole life, the lies, the stealing, the abuse, the things that you've seen, try to do right in life. Um, not saying from you, but from other people you yeah. were surrounded with on edge, because the central nervous system is a powerful thing. Yeah. No matter how game we think we are, we can shut it off, we can't. Because I've seen some of the strongest men on this planet, some serious killers, break. Mm. Because it's not here's not normal. We're not brought on this planet to harm people no. and lie and steal and cheat and everything that we do. But we do because it's fucking here in front of us. We're living yeah. in a weird society. I genuinely don't know what world, the world is. I think we're in a computer game. I feel as if this is like a <laughs> like an avatar, <laughs> like, like, a, like the Matrix. Yeah, I that's what. What's the name? Said you knew him, Andrew Tate. Yeah, I've had him on twice, Andrew. And mm. I just. I don't, it feels like an avatar, it feels like we're in a game and then you've got metaverse, you're even in another game, I feel as if there's different levels to it, to get to the real source, which I, I don't know could be, I believe it might be a beautiful thing, mm -hmm. I've been around people when they've took their last breath, mm. and um, when they take their last breath, it's not a, a last breath of pain or misery, it's a last breath of, <sighs> yeah. it's a fucking relief, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like a relief, yeah. they're away. Like, this is a mad experience in here. I know how you go in computer games and you can pick your own avatar and the way you want to dress them and mm. their jobs. I think this is it, man. I just, that's my own opinion from Can I just say I'd pick something better than me? <laughs> <laughs> I'll have an Audi R, right? Yeah, yeah. But it's just, it's just, I don't know what it is. But how did you then work on yourself to make sure you, you never get sent back? I, um, I don't think I physically worked on it. I think it just, um, I think it just came. Yeah. And I think I just, it was a gradual growing process. Were you scared that you went nuts again? Oh, absolutely. I still am. See, when you lost And it, I, have got, I have got that in me. I know. Yeah, because see, when because I'd done a homeless documentary, mm -hmm. slept on the street for seven days, and after four days, I thought, I'm a homeless. I questioned my own... I, I, my mind went, because I wasn't really sleeping much. Mm. So I was sleep deprived, because you only sleep like 20 minutes or half an hour, yeah. because you're hearing noises, and you're, I was scared that I was getting fucking stabbed. Or, yeah. 
I was too strong and big anyway to like, be raped or abused. But I know people get spat on, shot on, peed on, and um, people get stabbed. So I was always on guard. But mm. after four days, I thought, am I losing my shit here? I started mm. to think, have I got family? Because I've not got a phone, I've no money. Mm. Like, am I just, can, am I psychotic? Because I get like, yeah, yeah, it's like yeah. I had dementia, but then <laughs> I would get pictures of them, I can't be. And then, um, but, and that was only four, seven days on the streets, but I started to kind of lose my bearings a bit. Mm. Not all the time, but they would, I was start questioning mm. my own sanity. See, when you lost your shit, did you know that you were losing it or did you just feel normal? Oh, no, when I, I, knew, I, I didn't notice when, when, I went the, when I'd gone the full money, but I did, people were saying, well, are you on a Coke? At the start, mm -hmm. when I was starting the mania phase, at the, are you on a gear? Mate, you're, you're like a hot cat on a hot tune roof. <laughs> oh, am I? Yeah, I am, actually, aren't I? Yeah, you know, and I like, threatened to lamp a few people in the pub for looking at me the wrong way, which has never been me. I've never been a, mm -hmm. a, an argumentative soul. Did you ever question, though, that could have been you and the other guy was an act? Yeah. Yeah, you don't know, do you? Not mean. And even now, before this happened, I'd, I'd, I would say we're the longest fuse in the history of the world. Now, I'm, I'm an inch maximum. Literally, piss taking, lying, I'm off the scale, mad, quick. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I have to button myself back in again. I have to fucking wire my neck in. You know, because I just think if, I, if it was the wrong person in front of me, when, 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 I, when I felt like that, I'd be going to jail. What was it like trying to take your own life? Awful. But also weird because I thought, well, this is the end. If I can manage to cut through my femoral artery, I'm definitely going to die. And, and the end of the torment I've had for two years will be gone. And then I thought, well, what about your kids? What would they say if they come in when they find you lying in bed in a pool of blood? Well, that wouldn't be very nice. And I, yeah, like all them thoughts whirl around you. And you're, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Um, and I think it takes a great deal of balls to actually go through the full act of, of suicide. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a coward's way. I think it's a it's a balls of steel finish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm the same. Like I believe everybody talks about mental health now and people struggling this and that. I feel as if we can talk about it too much mm. because it's still at an all time high, if not mm. the worst it's ever been. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel with mental health and suicide, being vulnerable and sometimes fragile or weak or whatever people want to call it, when they're not doing anything about it and they just vegetate and fester and. Um, because a lot of people turn to drink and drugs and other stuff mm. and that's the wrong thing because it'll make it a hundred times worse but like you say taking your life is the most bravest thing on the planet mm. because that takes massive balls to know that you're never going to come back and once yeah. you don't once you do that there's no going back to your life there's no try to re rectify what it is you're struggling with and and that's the scary thing because everybody's got so much to give mm. and if, if they could only just believe it just for that second to realize well wait a minute my life's not over. I've got something to fucking give because people think it's over because of a relationship. I lost a job and a few grand a, a debt. Yeah. Fuck that. There's fucking four million birds on the planet. There's money can be made anywhere. Yeah. Listen, you're at the bottom tier. You're at the bottom. You've got, not got fuck all, but the only way is up. Yeah. Get your fucking ass to the gym. I don't care if you're fat yeah. as fuck, skinny, mm. whatever it is. Just go exercise. Mm. Go in the Stairmaster or walk around the park or whatever it is. Mm. Just try and get yourself out in nature. Yeah. Cut away the drink, cut away the drugs, <coughs> fucking switch off your TV and for, by all means put down your phone because fuck me, the social media side of things and people are living in a fake world and electronic likes, controls are there, how many likes to get, am I loved, am I not, am I hated? Fuck all that. Put down your phone, get out in nature mm. and then start realising, okay, I can change. Get a piece of paper and write down your goal. Write yeah. down things that you want to achieve. Yeah, good Things idea, that yeah. you want to stop and once it becomes clearer in your mind, mm. it's more likely to happen. So, like you say, it is a brave thing to take your own life, but at the end of the day, we say it's okay. It's okay not to be, what is it? It's, what did they say? It's okay not to be okay. Or, yeah, they do, it. yeah. So it cannot be okay. Yeah, yeah but it's mm. not okay to live there. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Can't live there. We can't go, okay, it's okay. Listen, <laughs> yeah, yeah. be misery and pain for years and years. No, fucking do something about it. Fight back because yeah. everybody's got that inner strength. You were mm. lowest to the low, suicidal, padded cell. <laughs> thought you never got out of it, but you're sitting here, you're out of it, you've exactly. got a book out. Yeah. People can change. Yeah. And that uh, was one, this, I've written in the book there. I said, if, if you're having a shit life, blame yourself. Yeah. I said, you're not responsible for what happens in your life, but you are responsible for how you deal with what happens. Well, you percent. And you can take it one way or the other, mm -hmm. upwards or downwards. That's a choice you personally make by your lack or willingness to act differently. Yeah. What's your biggest life lesson that you've learned? <clears throat> um, biggest life lesson. Oh, no, I think I think if. Uh, if Biggest mistake I've made in my life, biggest mistake, was falling out with my daughter. Because 
she was me in a skirt and still is me in a skirt. She's my personality in a skirt. She was going to join the police. She, she had so much I wanted her to do, but we've fallen out and it's, it's heartbreaking. I absolutely miss her. Yeah. If your daughter watches us by any chance, what would you say to her? I say, Ella, we're a long time dead. I think we should talk. If it's not right for you where you are, it's not to do with me. If he's the right man, fine. If he's not, fine. Uh, I'd, I'd love to see you again soon. Yeah, that's what it's all about, isn't it? Because everything that we go through, because we can go, again, it's that thing out where we block it out. Mm. We go day by day and we think, oh, because it's always at the back of your mind. Mm. I'm the same with my son. There's always mm. bickering her back and forth, and I think, well, fuck this, it's just too much. But it's still my son. Yeah. Honestly, if he calls me and now I'm there, yeah, he's yeah. in trouble, I'm there. What do you need? I would die for my son. Yeah. I would go to prison for my kids. Me I would too. fucking, I would kill for them. That's not just to try and be a big man. I just know what I've got to then go. Listen, I, I don't mind. I'd rather sit in a prison cell knowing that my kids are protected because every father should be protecting their kids. Yeah. You don't want to go down that route, by all means, never, because we know how the destruction it causes, but yeah. it's your family. Mm -hmm. And if they Family's everything. To, yeah, and, everything. And it, it's scary because mm. we do, and I was a fuck up for years, so I've only got myself to blame as well. And mm. to grow that bond at the start, it's, it's so important. So try to claw back and claw mm. back the missed opportunities and the missed years mm. and the missed days and mm. this and that. It can be difficult for a father, mm. but you just got to stand your ground and just, I would always be there for my kids no matter what. Family's everything for mm. me, but yeah. listen, like I say, they're pained in the asses. It's not yeah, absolutely. Yeah. fights and arguments, you think, fuck off. I'm never speaking to them again. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, I'm like that. It's I'm a stubborn, the same. I'm a stubborn bastard. Yeah. As much as I want it, oh, when all my family's there, I want to just go home and, <laughs> and sit myself. So I see all this shit. It's like a contradiction. Yeah. I want all my family, I do everything for them. Yeah. But when I'm with them, I think, you are all doing my fucking yeah. thing. Everyone's <laughs> talking shit and arguing and bickering. Yeah. And I'm thinking it's just stressful. But these are the times that you wouldn't change because we're a short fucking, you, like you say, we're a long time dead. And mm -hmm. I read something there that if people only see their parents once or twice a year, and if they've only got maybe 10, 20 years left on this planet, you're only going to see them another 10 or 20 times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. that fucking yeah. hit me, man. Yeah, that yeah. That hit me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because... I don't know why we're on this planet. I believe there's a good source and people can be good. There's so much. Listen, you've seen a lot of bad in your life, but there's a lot of good goes on as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Look at the people who do the homeless work and people in hospitals and nurses wiping asses and mm. doing that sort of yeah. stuff. And the people who just good souls who mm. have, maybe I don't know whether they've been through trauma or have not, but they just want to help people. They're good people. They would never do you a bad turn. They would never steal but there is a lot of goodness. Look at the nature, look at the mountains, look at the sky, the sun, yeah. the moon, the sea. Yeah. There's so much beauty in the world, but we just concentrate on the negatives. I don't know if that's why the media bombards you with for years and the, the TV and the radios, it's just all negative yep. shit. When there's people out there doing charity work and saving children and help people become better. and Never gets noticed. Never, because it doesn't sell. Mm. I could have the most inspirational man on this planet and nobody but he's asked. But I've got yourself on undercover cop locked up in a fucking mental institute, <laughs> suicidal, lost all his fucking females in his life to guys in Turkey. <laughs> People were like, oh, I love this fucking podcast. It's, uh, how are you feeling now? Oh, it's always good to talk, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, talk, and that's the book's, the book was therapeutic. Yeah. Writing it down, remembering it all. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it was a joy to write. And I hope, I hope it will buy it. I mean, I do want to say thanks. There's a guy called Andy who I've only met since I met Jane. And he made me, I started it 10 years ago. I never finished it. Mm -hmm. And uh, he made me, he said, look, he said, that's, that's line of duty. Real, not fiction. Line of duty, real, not fiction. He said, you should get that out there. And I went, I tell you what, Andy, I will. Mm -hmm. And that's how I did it. Yeah, but this will, the, the podcast will give it a, a boost. Oh, that'd be nice. So, yeah, well, yeah. And yeah, listen, if you want to go on another podcast, I'm more than happy to put you on to people. Um, <laughs> Great story, unbelievable mm. for what you've come from, what you've overcome, mm. you fucked up again, now you're back. Mm. Um, yeah, what's the, the best thing about being a police officer? What was the best thing? The best thing about being a police officer is, for me, was being, helping people as well as locking them up. And also, even when I locked them up, I still liked them. Yeah. And I, could, and I, I don't think you'd find a guy who I locked up who would say, he's a wrong one. I didn't like him. They all, they all talk to me like I'm their mate. Even after they'd gone to jail and come back out again. Do you know what I mean? They, we were still friends. 
I think you've got that personality. See, when you were in there, just before we finish up, seeing you, you were in there, did you get questioned for like split personality or all that? Like you can play certain characters for that. You can, you could, same as me, <clears throat> sit me across from a nun, a priest, a gangster, <clears throat> a terrorist. <clears throat> I'll have them all laughing. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I think I'm psychotic. That's just basically my appellation tools. The reason why my guests relax and open up is they're sort of, I'm your friend, this and I yeah. am, but it's to get the story to then make them relax. But again, it's 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 like a chess move. Yeah, yeah. It's like different characters, different yeah. faces for different places. Ironically, the people in the mental home didn't believe I was an ex Undercover officer. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> they thought I was in the base of these nuts. <laughs> uh -huh. Could could you have potentially been in there as well as an undercover cop to get information for the mentally ill? I don't think the police has got the balls to put people inside custody yeah. to do that kind of stuff because it's such a rough environment mm -hmm. and the dangers are so so high. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You don't have to be you don't I'll give you an example. A guy I know, um, he killed somebody for stealing his three pound binatone radio. I said, you got 15 years on top for a three pound radio. He goes, Rob, it's not the radio. It's not the money. It's the principle. If I let him take my radio, he'll be back with others to take my ass. And that's not happening. So I killed him. And that's all he said. What were you thinking when you're in there with these people? With, because do you feel as if it was granted for you to be there? especially when you're in with colours and terrorists and inside the mental institute? Oh, no. It was, it was surreal. It was, uh, it was one guy who was a murderer. He used to walk around, around the square every day, wouldn't talk to anybody. I, I don't, I'm not talking to anybody. He's about to be a snitch. I used to fucking run after him. <laughs> Catch him and I'm like, oh, Steve, how are you doing? <laughs> I'll still be jogging. I need to get quick and quick. I said, well, what do we do is talk, mate. Let's have a talk. You know, it's good to talk. Mm -hmm. And by the end of the three months, he was walking around with me talking. Yeah. Just me and him. He didn't have to speak to nobody. How are you feeling today after going through some of your journey? Good. Yeah, listen, yeah, good. you smashed it, man. Yeah. I genuinely hope your book does well. I'll leave the link in the description <laughs> for people to get. But just before we finish up, for anybody that's in that struggle, for anybody that doesn't think there's a way out, maybe losing that loved one or their partner or their job, maybe feeling like ending it like you've done, what advice would you have for them? Don't do it. Because eventually you can bring it round. You can bring it around with a bit of medical help as well, a bit, bit of some c chemical help, but definitely you can bring it around. And I'm having a great life now. I'm having the best life I've ever had. And the woman I'm with is the best woman I've ever had. So, you know, don't give it up. Life, life is a great gift. Keep it. Lee Murray as well. Yeah. Um, he's been in about over 20 years in Morocco, one of yeah. the biggest heists in the UK. I don't know if it's still the biggest. Um, but what's your connection with you and Lee Murray? Well, basically, um, I mean, it's an odd thing, me being ex flying squad, but um, Lightning Lee Murray, or Lee Murray as he's known to his friends, um, he's by family sort of related to me in a very distant way. And um, uh, all I'm saying is if, if there's anybody out there, lawyer wise, or anybody with a, with a shed load of money who, who thinks that it's time, he's done his time, he's the only guy of the, on the road who's still inside. He's been in Morocco for 20, since 2006, I think. You know, seven, 27 years or something. He got a 30 year stretch. All the other boys are out. Give him a break and send him home to his family. They, his, his kids need a dad and, and his partner needs a needs husband. Get, get him out, please. If you can help get him out, contact James and let's get it sorted. Thank you very how much. Can, um, how's, how is he still over? Is that because he's Moroccan? They've kept him for that long. How can he not get uh, um, sent over to the UK? Has he applied for? I think I think there's been a lot of underhand stuff on that. You know, he, he shouldn't be there. He, sh he shouldn't be there now. All the boys are out by him. It's ridiculous. And yeah. I think there's a bit of bit, bit of government play here. Yeah, it'd be great to get him out. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to see him out. Yeah. I know a few boys who know him and he yeah. was proper. Yeah. 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 But yeah, like I say, he served his time. Hopefully he can get out and anybody. Yeah. I know there's petitions. I know there's, I don't know if it's his sister or whatever it is, somebody that's on Instagram that's got a petition. So anybody that's there, go over, sign a petition and try and push it to try and get him out. But listen, Rob, for coming on today and telling your story. I thoroughly enjoyed it, man. Me too, listen, me too. Listen, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, proud of you. And anybody that's wanted to buy the book, we'll leave a link in the description. Hopefully we can give it a good push for you. Um, a lot of great stories in there. I wish you nothing but the best for the future. God bless you. And stay out of Turkey, bro. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>